A newish Apple iPhone, an old Achilles tendon, and more of the same in U.S. equity markets. Live from Studio 2 at Bloomberg headquarters here in New York, I'm Romain Bostic. And I'm Scarlett Poo. We're kicking off to the closing bell here in the U.S. More of the same in U.S. equities insofar as we're mixed right now. The S&P 500 and the Nasdaq 100, we should mention, basically sitting right at their 50-day moving average. Tech stocks, the big drag here on the broader market overall. Not a whole lot of change in the Treasury market either as investors mark time before the CPI report tomorrow. You can see the two yield moving up slightly by one basis point to just 5% even. And of course, the dollar is something we've been looking at. The U.S. dollar resuming its gains after a pause yesterday. Of course, these gains are fairly modest, up only one-tenth of 1% 1 remain. Yeah, the market certainly biding in its time right now in a bit of a holding pattern. Ahead of key three data points here, consumer sentiment data coming out on Friday, retail sales on Thursday, and of course, CPI tomorrow on Wednesday. Month to month, economists looking for a re-acceleration in headline consumer price is to the fastest, the fastest pace in more than a year. Yeah, really. And an interesting, albeit somewhat backward-looking, separate data point came out earlier today from the Census Bureau. It highlighted the pain the higher prices have already inflicted. Household income in 2022, it was down 2.3% when you adjust for inflation. That's the third straight year of declines, the biggest decrease since 2010, and a reminder that all those wage and wealth gains over the past couple of years, they've been more or less X'd out by the higher cost of living. The inflation set up for tomorrow among some of the, one of the most read stories on the Bloomberg terminal today. One of the other most read stories, it involves our old friend Bill Gross. And as the late great Omar Little once said, if you come at the king, you best not miss. Bill Gross, the former bond king who took PIMCO from a multi-million dollar business to a multi-trillion dollar firm over the course of four decades, knows how to hold a grudge. Gross out at the Future Proof Conference in California with Joe Weisenthal and Tracy Alloway. We're going to let you know what he had to say about his legacy as a bond manager and where he thinks his competitor, Jeff Gunlack, ranks on the list of all-time greats. It ain't high. And the latest Bank of America Global Fund Manager survey is out. The main takeaway today, Scarlett, investors really starting to sour right now on the dollar, really, really starting to sour right now on real estate, and really, really, really starting to sour on China. Yeah, there's a lot of negativity there that you just summed up. And the net result is investors are all in on U.S. stocks, according to Bank of America's latest Global Fund Manager survey. It finds that concern this month over China's sputtering economy has sparked a stampede out of emerging markets as a whole resulting in specific crowded trades like betting against Chinese stocks and shorting the U.S. dollar, which had been on a massive winning streak up until last week. Uh, the beneficiaries, U.S. big tech, as you can see here, which is seen as a safe haven, and treasury bills, which are short-duration government debt. Now, this most recent rush into U.S. big tech has created valuations that look uncomfortably expensive. Here's the price earnings ratio of the S&P 500 Infotech Index over the past decade, so going all the way back to mid-2013. Here's the pandemic in early 2020 that dropped down, followed immediately by a sharp recovery and more. Those were the fang stocks days right around here. And then the hangover in 2022 as you go down, and the AI hype and a magnificent seven uh, narrative really took hold again in early 2023. As recently as July, early July, in fact, the multiple was two standard deviations above the long-term average remain. Yeah, absolutely. Here, and before we get to our next guest, just on a word on tech, we should point out right now, shares of Oracle right now hitting fresh uh, intraday lows here, now having their worst day going back to 2001. We're going to get to that story a little bit later, as well as the discussion about Apple. Those shares lower as well here with a focus on tech and whether tech can still deliver the returns that so many investors had embraced earlier this year. Catherine Avery, CEO and president of Catherine Avery Investment Management, joining us right now as we kick you off to the close here on this Tuesday afternoon. And Catherine, I do want to start with these tech stocks, a magnificent seven, mm -hmm. if you will, here. They were certainly magnificent in the first six months or so of the year, not so much as of late here. Is there anything attractive you find there? Not for the Magnificent Seven, but I would say that you might want to look at some of the other names in tech, what we would refer to as staple tech. Um, those names in technology that are trading at valuations much lower than the S&P tech sector, but we need their infrastructure in order to have tech run. So, you know, for example, um, names like Cisco, um, their data centers are what's needed to help run 
the new AI that's coming out, um, names like Oracle and Broadcom that offer the chips and the software that would support that AI trade. Um, these stocks are all paying dividends. Um, Broadcom and Oracle have both had double digit dividend increases um, in the past year, and we expect that to continue. Mm -hmm. um, I know these names have taken a little bit of a seat back yeah. um, in yeah. the past month, but the long term outlook is still good for these companies. And um, I think that getting paid to wait makes it worthwhile. Well, we've certainly seen uh, some investors uh, shining to some of those names uh, that you mentioned just there uh, on that list. I am curious about another sector, Catherine, that has been a big focus outside of tech, and that has been energy and sort of what uh, I guess the future holds specifically for the stocks when you overlay that against what we've been seeing, the fluctuation in energy prices itself. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of the energy um, pricing, oil in particular, you know, um, has been taking a step back this year because of um, the, the weakness that we've pretty much seen in China. Um, but now as we're coming into this second half of the year, we're starting to see supply constraints. So that's why we're seeing this uptick in the price of oil um, and, you know, possibly seeing that price go up to the highs that we saw last year. And couple that again with the fact that these stocks came off of a great year in 2022, but had gotten very inexpensive in 2023, but are still delivering good earnings, lots of cash flow that they're returning to the shareholders. So again, the dividends are there, the valuations are intact, and having that price of oil move up makes that an attractive place for investors to start to look at. And it's not just staple technology or energy. You also look at cyclicals in the same way. You're overweight that sector. I'm curious whether that extends to small caps as well, which are uh, kind of cyclical um, squared in a way because they're so sensitive to every move in the economy. The Russell 2000 outperformed the S&P 500 for about two and a half months at the start of the year. And since then, it's resumed its position as being a laggard. Are small caps about to have a moment here? Um they possibly can, um, but you know our focus is really looking at the larger cap names. You know, as you mentioned before, you know the dollar is starting to take a step back, um, and that is actually good for a lot of the U.S. multinationals that not only do business here in the U.S. but have a lot of exposure outside the U.S. as well. Um, a lot of these um, larger companies uh, will be able to take advantage of the that infrastructure plays going into the next couple of years. Um, the smaller cap stocks will also be able to take advantage of that as well. So, you know, we had, if, if you look back, you know, we basically had a recession in earnings estimates in the first half of this year, and we're starting to see a reacceleration of that. But that's probably, a lot of that reacceleration is going to be coming from a lot of these cyclical names that have been able to participate in the infrastructure rebuilding. Catherine, it was a great conversation here. We have to get you back for something a little bit longer. Catherine Avery there, she's the CEO of Catherine Avery Investment Management, helping us kick you off to the close here on this Tuesday afternoon, a Tuesday afternoon where everyone's focused on Cupertino, California, a new Apple Watch, a new iPhone, Scarlet, 48 megapixels, I'm told. We're going to tell you what it actually means for investors. Yeah, but a new cord, too, a new charging cord. A cord? I don't know about that. Oh, yeah. my gosh. I know. They still use yeah. cords. That's got to be worth a few billion dollars <laughs> on market cap. Arm and Instacart are generating some interest in tech IPOs this week, but it comes at a cost. We're going to get insight from a tech executive who helped take Bumble public. And it's hard to understate just how significant the collapse of Lehman Brothers was. Fourth largest investment bank at the time. 15 years ago this week, that company filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. And well, we know the rest of the story. A lot of conversations coming up a little bit later here about the financial regulations that came after that and maybe more financial regulations still on tap. That discussion and so much more. This is Bloomberg. The problem with raising capital requirements over and over again is you're making U.S. banks less competitive, and that's going to push activity out into the unregulated non-banking sector. Better supervision, uh, more diverse stress testing. Uh, better uh, rules on, uh, you know, interest rate risk taking, 
uh, could, could go a long way to avoid these kind of problems. I'm not sure raising the capital requirements of the biggest money center banks by 15 to 20 percent is the answer. The former New York Fed President Bill Dudley, now a Bloomberg Opinion columnist, talking a little bit earlier about, well, how to make the U.S. financial system safer. His comments coming on the week of the 15th anniversary of the collapse of Lehman Brothers. It was the climax of the subprime mortgage crisis, and it sent shockwaves through global markets. It triggered the largest Chapter 11 bankruptcy petition in U.S. history at the time, involving more than $600 billion in assets. And we should also point out that that same week, you had Merrill Lynch get sold. And of course, a few months prior to that, you had the collapse of Bear Stearns. It was a phenomenal time, not only for, well, the bad there, 25,000 people plus here being forced out of jobs, but of course what it wrought on our financial system and the regulations that govern it. Dennis Gelleher is the co-founder and president and CEO of Better Markets, and Better Markets is holding a special event uh, tomorrow down in Washington, D.C. to talk, I guess, just about how far we've come over those 15 years, Dennis. And I guess the big question is, have we come far enough? Uh, well, thanks, Romain. Nice to be with you. Yes, we're holding a conference tomorrow. It's virtual, and everybody can join it. And we've got some big headliners, uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren, SEC Chairman Gary Gensler, CFPB Director Rohit Chopra. And anybody can um, listen in. Just go to our website, www.bettermarkets.org, and sign up, and you can join us. And we've got another dozen or so experts to talk about not only what happened 15 years ago, but where we are today, what happened in the meantime, including just six months ago when we had a banking crisis where the second, third, and fourth largest bank failures in history happened six months ago. So there have been some important lessons learned. There have been some important rules, regulations on the banks and the non-banks. Mm -hmm. But the real question is, are we safe enough? And is too big to fail still too big and too alive? Well, well that's what I'm curious about here. I mean, th there was no debate at the time that there was material systemic risk here from whether it was what first happened with Bear Stearns earlier in the year and then of course later with Merrill and Lehman on the same week uh, to be sure here. Uh, I'm not so sure you can say the same thing about the systemic risk out of the regional banking crisis or is that misleading? Well, um, given that the recent regional banking crisis is going to cost taxpayers more than $30 billion for the bailouts, keeping in mind uh, they were bailed out because they needed capital. They were undercapitalized. That's also what happened in 08. Uh, Merrill Lynch, Lehman Brothers, Goldman Sachs, all the big money center banks and many non-banks didn't have enough capital to cover their own losses. They also didn't have enough liquidity and they didn't have resolution plans so that they could go into bankruptcy like every other company in America that fails. And so there have been a lot of rules put in place, but we find out six months ago that many of those rules weren't applicable to banks of the size of $100 billion in assets or so, or a little bit more, and yet they caused a, a systemic event, contagion, because we saw depositors fleeing, we saw other banks um, ending up on the precipice of failure that required the bailouts. And so by definition, they were systemically significant, and there's still too many systemically significant banks and non-banks that don't have enough capital. Remember, the country has never suffered from a crisis because of overcapitalized banks. Hmm. It's undercapitalized banks that are a threat to this country. And those are just banks. What about private equity and the shadow banking system that, that's out there? We know regulators such as um, the SEC's Gary Gensler has been looking into trying to rein them in and, and get some kind of handle over them. But that's kind of a looming threat out there in terms of whether you're seeing um, a lot at stake that, that's not fully accounted for, not even fully understood. Well, you're absolutely right, Scarlett. There's a major problem with the under-regulation of the shadow banking system, the non-banks. They're both not transparent and they're not regulated. And Bill Dudley, your guest earlier, made a good point there. And frankly, Jamie Dimon's made a good point that that, that non-bank system doesn't have enough regulation or transparency. There's too much systemic risk there that we don't even know about. That's what happened with AIG and a bunch of other non-banks back in 2008 that surprised everybody yeah. because it wasn't regulated. But what has to be done is not what the banks want. They're saying, don't regulate us because the non-banks aren't regulated. The, the fact is, banks need to be regulated a little bit more, and non-banks need to be regulated a lot. And the Financial Stability Oversight Council needs to get back in the business of regulating non-banks. And you're also right, Scarlett, that the SEC has a role to play here, as does the CFPB, both of whom are going to be speaking at our conference tomorrow and addressing too big to fail and these systemic threats from a market regulator's right. point of view 
and from a consumer financial protection point of view. So, Dennis, what's interesting, of course, is when we talk about too big to fail, that was once a bad thing. It's become a better thing, I suppose, is the way to put it, especially in the wake of what we saw in March. Suddenly, too big to fail looked like the safest place to be. If you're going to take your money out of Silicon Valley Bank and move it to Chase, you felt pretty good. Well, you're right, but it's perverse incentives, right? I mean, too big to fail is never a good thing because what too big to fail really means is that the biggest banks in the country that pose the biggest threat to the financial system don't have to worry about failing because if their recklessness or illegal conduct or just bad business decisions leads them to failure, mm -hmm. unlike every other company in America, they won't go to bankruptcy, they'll get bailed out by taxpayers. That's wrong, and that's why too big to fail has to be uh, reined in. That's why we need more capital liquidity on the biggest banks, no matter what Wall Street says. Right. And that's why we need more regulation of the non-banks, and we need it fast. All right. Well, we still, we'll see how Washington stands up to the lobbyists. Dennis, really appreciate you <laughs> joining us. Dennis Kelleher of Better Markets. I'm glad he brought up AIG. I forgot about that. I mean, that was is this September of well, 08. Yes. I mean, you had AIG getting the bailout. Yeah. You, of course, you had the collapse of Merrill, or basically the, sell, the sale of Merrill. Mm -hmm, the force The collapse sale. of Lehman. And then, of course, you had Bear Stearns earlier that year. Yeah. And, and then there was the AIG bonuses. Remember that? Yeah, it was like 160-something. Yeah, that caused a lot of uproar. All right, still ahead, the clock is ticking on negotiations between the UAW and U.S. automakers. We've got the latest out of D Detroit next. Even after reaching a landmark labor contract with Teamsters this year, UPS sees a bumpy road ahead. It's set to pay out the biggest chunk of its new $30 billion five-year labor pact over the next 12 months. The CEO, Carol Tomei, says, we put more cost in our business this year than we had anticipated in an environment where the volume has receded. So let's bring in our Thomas Black for more. Tom, so what is Carol Tomei doing to win back the customers it lost in the lead up to uh, the potential strike? She talked about winning on service, but we'll see if they're going to have to give some discounting as well. It's going to be a, a tough market because the whole industry is, is suffering from declines in demand. So there's uh, a, a lot of companies fighting over fewer customers. Well, exactly. But I, I've always thought that UPS was in sort of a little bit of a different position here. I mean, in terms of their actual competitors here, it's a pretty short list, as I'm sure you know here. Why are they struggling so much to, I guess, absorb some of these higher labor costs in a way that maybe other industries might be able to absorb? UPS is very efficient. Uh, that's a good thing. But it also makes it more difficult to become even more efficient and absorb those costs. So they've got a lot of work to cut out for them to, to find those efficiencies, a lot through automation, a lot through having that unified network where they have really good uh, visibility into their data to be able to um, tweak the system and make it more efficient. So that's what they're going to be concentrating on and winning back those customers. They lost, they estimate that they lost about 1.2 million packages per day of volume to, to competitors mm -hmm. and they have to go get that back. All right. Well, it's a long road ahead for Carol Tomei and UPS. Thomas Blank, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to move over now to Detroit because time is ticking on talks between the UAW and the automakers. Bloomberg learning that the UAW has lowered its pay increase demand slightly to 36 percent from 40 percent. Our Keith Naughton has more. So, Keith, um, they're talking. That's good. But from 40 percent to 36 percent doesn't really move the needle a lot for the car makers, does it? No, not at all. Uh, they uh, actually are still quite far apart. Um, I think the highest offer uh, the automakers have made was a 16 percent raise. So there's a gulf that they really need to, to uh, cross, and there's not much time left. Well, give us a sense here of what the options are right now, Keith. I mean, when I see the demands that the UAW has made, and at least their argument as far as them looking back at past profits and revenues, saying that they wouldn't share in that here, is there room for compromise there? Yeah, I mean, we have started to see some movement, which we had, you know, up until uh, the weekend. Um, there's a lot of uh, movement that still needs to be made before they reach the deadline of just before midnight on Thursday. Um, but, you know, there have been some sounds uh, of optimism. Uh, we heard from, a, you know, UAW vice president who said he was optimistic that uh, they might be able to reach an agreement. But, boy, there's still a lot of work ahead of them. 
So we know the White House, Joe Biden, the president, appointed Gene Sperling to act as a liaison between the automakers and the unions. Do we have any sense of whether he has begun his role? Has he done anything that we know of? Yeah, he said he's been in contact with them. I mean, you know, all of the politicians are in contact. Michigan's governor, Gretchen Whitmer, also says she's in contact with them. But there's only so much they can do. You know, it's about the economics here. And, um, and they are on very different pages right now uh, on, you know, what the economics should be. Uh, give us a sense. Okay, well, let's talk about the economics a little bit more. I mean, we've been here before, Keith. I mean, it's uh, strikes in this uh, uh, industry aren't exactly rare. You go back to 2019 when UAW had, what was it, more than a month-long strike there. I know we were able to quantify to some degree just how much that hit GM. Is it going to? Are we going to see similar losses this time around? Yeah, that was a that was a big hit to GM that 40-day strike in 2019. And yeah, I mean, there's expected to be a very large economic impact if they go out on strike. They would be taking 150,000 workers out. They've never struck all three companies before, and if and that's what Sean Fain, the UAW president, says he plans to do. If that happens, you know, there within 10 days, there's a five billion dollar impact on the GDP. Autos account for three percent of the GP, GDP. But here in the Midwest, it's even larger. And uh, economic experts we've spoken with say it would drive Michigan and the upper Midwest into a recession. Yeah, everyone keeping an eye on the potential economic ramifications. And of course, those can quickly, Keith, become political ramifications for uh, the president uh, out there. Keith Naughton, our man uh, out there uh, in Detroit here, keeping an eye on. Well, we talked, Scarlett, about a strike that was averted with UPS and now maybe one that actually goes through here with the yeah. UAW and GM. Still pretty far apart. But when you go through the demands that GM made, there's been so much talk about this 40 percent raise that right. UAW working for. But I thought it was compelling when they sort of went through the profitability over the past few years and how they basically did not really share in that upward mobility. This seems less about profitability in the future and more about recouping some yes. of what they think they were owed. I'm past. so glad you said that because a yeah. lot of it was they gave up too much yes. in 2008. And so they now did. the union wants to claw back some of the things that they had to give up, right? Yeah. The resumption of traditional pensions, defined uh, benefit, yeah. uh, defined contribution uh, benefits, and of yeah. course, the restoration of retiree health care plans and boost in pension yeah. payments. I mean, these are structural issues. And also getting rid of that tiered system. I mean, we've written a, yeah. a lot about this at Bloomberg. I mean, you could have two people working on the f same floor together right next to each other. Other, and one's making, you know, $25 an hour mm -hmm. with very few benefits, and the other is making maybe 45 with full benefits and pension, and that creates a lot of animosity. Yeah, the and the younger generation, yeah. Gen Z, is asking and talking about salaries in a way that perhaps uh, older generations never did. All right, well, this is exactly why CEOs get paid the big bucks, because they're supposed to navigate this, and if they can't navigate it, then I guess maybe you shouldn't be CEO. A lot more coverage coming up here on Bloomberg. Stick with us. We'll be back in a moment. This is the countdown to the close, and I right now on the broader market, still kind of in a holding pattern right now, awaiting that big inflation report. Not getting any help today from the energy space. Crude oil prices higher on the day. Abigail Doolittle standing by with our commodities close. Yeah, no help here at all on the inflation front, Romaine. Take a look at these gains for some commodities that we're highlighting. You were just talking about crude oil up 1.8 percent. And this, of course, as this oil rally that we've had in recent weeks over the last couple of months, in fact, uh, just continues. Some are saying that the OPEC plus production cuts while well, they're setting up the oil market to be the tightest it's been in a decade. Natural gas also getting a nice bid up 5.2 percent. Weather apparently is behind that big move. As for cotton up six tenths of one percent. Traders are waiting for a USDA report that's expected to show that cotton both a domestic and a global front uh, is somewhat constrained. Uh, and then sugar up 1.4 percent 1.5 percent. The CEO of a Brazilian sugar company is saying that uh, they do not see any scenario of sugar price reduction remain. It looks like sugar traders are uh, taking into account that report, and uh, they are also not taking into the account that I'm still not eating sugar. You would think that, <laughs> that would actually bring it in the wrong other direction, but not today. All right, Abigail Doolittle once again bragging about her healthy lifestyle there. Always appreciate her insights there for our commodity close. We do want to turn back to the world of tech right now with a slate of upcoming tech IPOs breathing some new life into the market. 
Arm, Instacart, two of the companies that could potentially come to market. Arm coming out at a valuation some $15 billion below where it was expected weeks ago. And Instacart also seeking a valuation that would put it at about 75% below the level that last raised cash back in 2021. But our next guest has plenty of experience taking a company public. He played an instrumental role in bringing Bumble to the public markets when he served as president of that company. Pleased to say he's joining us right now. Uh, Tarek Sharkat joining us. He is now, as we just learned today, been named the co-CEO of a private company called Sonar. First of all, Tarek, congratulations on your new co-CEO role. And I'd be remiss in not Thank asking you, you right out of the gate as to whether this company ends up being a public company sometime soon. Well, thank you for having me and thanks for the congratulations. Um, you know, as part of what attracted me to Sonar is we are an open source technology company in the developer tool space. We have built on the backs of that community of 7 million developers that we have a really strong business, several hundred million dollars revenue, profitable. I think in this market in particular, this is important, a lot of free cash flow. And it gives us the option to, to, to control our own destiny, whether that's become a public company, whether it's continued to be private, we'll see. But we really feel like we're building a durable company for the future. I am curious about just how much uh, the market has changed in terms of uh, how these companies are valued, whether it's in the private space or whether they do uh, go exit into an IPO here. I mean, we've been talking about uh, the down rounds uh, for some of these names here. Uh, when you came to market with Bumble, I mean, that seemed so long ago, but it was just in 2021 when a lot of people were kind of on the fence as to whether the market could absorb uh, a major IPO like that. Do you think the time is right now for some of these names that we've been talking about? Well, I think the market has changed, as you as you say, and what the market was valuing in 2020 and 2021, which was really growth. That's what the market was valuing back in those days. With um, a, That has changed. With Bumble, we actually took public a profitable, um, high-growth company. With Sonar, here the company I've just joined as co-CEO, we are, again, emphasizing responsible growth, durable growth, and really building a great business. And I think you see that with a lot of these IPO filings now that people are emphasizing profitability, they're emphasizing durability, they're emphasizing free cash flow. And and really, do they have a real business here? Or is it something that just a lot of free capital has been pumping up over the years? I, I think as we see the success of these um, of these flotations, we will see more and more of those companies, the durable companies really come to market. So what would you say then, Tarek, is the selling point of a company like Arm, which is a mature, slow growth company? So not exactly the growth premium that you're talking about for 2021. It's a company that has dominant market share, but has definitely seen a market slowdown from its glory days. Well, and I think this all gets down to this durability point, right? And from everything I've heard from investors, everything that we're talking about inside of our companies, what, what you're really looking for is what is the moat? What is actually going to allow you to have a business that can last not just for a year or two or three, but really for a long time to really generate the dividends that that companies, that investors are looking for. And a company like Arm um, is central to a lot of the transformation and innovation happening in the AI world right now in just this continuing digitization of, uh, of the world. And so I think they're in a very strong position as a company, can't mm -hmm. speak about valuation or anything like that, but it is a company that has a lot going for it, in my opinion. And I'm glad you brought up AI because high growth tech stocks definitely got a huge lift from the AI hype early this year, but that hype seems to have peaked. It's no longer quite what it was before. These companies that are getting ready to go public that we've been looking at, uh, whether it's Clavio or Arm, they're not necessarily pure AI play companies. Should they be trying to market or pitch some kind of link to AI regardless, some kind of connection? Well, I think we've seen with the last couple of years that you don't want to oversell your business. You want to figure out how are you really generating value for your customers, for the users, and really building your business around that. One of the things that I think is really just at its infancy right now is people figuring out the use case for AI. And as they do that, I think baking in those use cases is important. If I think about Sonar, the company that I just joined, we are not, we, we use AI in our product, but there's a lot of software being built using AI. I think it's one of the killer apps that has come out right now. Copilots and coding assistants are really changing the face of software development. And what we do is use AI and traditional technology to help make sure that the code that's being built is secure, it's reliable, it doesn't have bugs, it is code that you feel good deploying. And I think as you find tangible places like that where you can 
really demonstrate value to users, you will mm -hmm. see AI really blossom. All right. Thank you so much. Our thanks to Tarek Shakat. He is former president of Bumble, helped take it public, and Google Cloud. And he is currently co-CEO of Sonar. And just on that point that he made about AI, uh, Romain, I, I think a lot of companies, though, would prefer kind of keeping it vague in terms of how AI is helping them. Wouldn't it be refreshing to have someone just honestly say, AI will help us because it, it'll just cut a lot of costs and make things uh, more streamlined, and we're not going to promise much more than that? Yeah, the problem is they can't say that because it's probably not true for most of these companies. And, and, I, and I don't say that to, as a diss, but I mean, we're still kind of in the experimental phase for a lot of these companies as to how it's deployed, how yeah. it's used. And there's been a lot of anecdotal evidence already saying that some of the use case, at least relative to the cost that yeah. you would need, just isn't really there, right? It's not a balance yet. And maybe it becomes in the future, but right now it's just Maybe that. the honest answer is we're figuring it out, but we'll get back to you as soon as we can figure it out. Are they going right. to call us when that? Or are they gonna be like, <laughs> is it going to be like a robocall and say we finally figured it out? No, they'll do I got one of these robocalls the other day. It was, and it was kind of infuriating because I didn't know it. For a second, I thought it was a real human. And oh, yeah, they I perfected realized, that. But then she was kind of janky, and I realized, oh, this is just a computer. Don't call Romaine up with your robocalls. Please don't. All right, still ahead, new Locked Apple products available oh, for Apple sale iPhone. today. Yeah, but the company is also pushing its sustainability agenda, really, with oh, $1,000 plus come phones. On. All right, we're going to discuss that after the break. This is Bloomberg. Time now for a review from the sell side with our top calls, big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And we start off with RTX, aerospace and defense company, getting a pair of downgrades today, including Barclays, lowering its recommendation to equal weight. This is on uncertainty over how long, and more importantly, how much it'll cost RTX to fix those issues with this GTF engine. Shares down another day, 2% here on this Tuesday. Next up, Hostess Brands, the maker of Twinkies and all your favorites' favorites, a downgrade today over at Stevens to equal weight from overweight, a slew of analysts activity around this company after the deal for J.M. Smuckers to buy the company, which the analyst actually says is a, quote, well executed sale. And finally, let's take a look at CVS Health, getting an upgrade today to outperform over at Wolf Research, with the analyst saying the CVS has the potential for earnings growth in 2025 and beyond, especially after it retained a four-star rating with one of its key insurers. Those shares having a pretty good day, up almost 3%, and those are some of our top calls. We do want to stay in the sell side space here and pivot to Apple, the granddaddy of them all, down about 2% on the day after announcing a host of new gadgets, including that new iPhone 15 and the Apple Watch Ultra. Joining us right now for his take is Martin Yang over at Oppenheimer. And let's start off here with the iPhone. We got four new models. We knew they were coming. Three of those models basically priced where the previous models were. But the highest end model, that price is actually ticking up by about 100 bucks, Martin, to about $1,200. Are you surprised by that? No. So when you uh, adjust for the storage, that price has not changed because the older price, $100 less, is only for 128 gig. So, um, you know, Apple's to Apple on the same 256 gig uh, storage, the price has not changed for Pro Max. Um, when we talk about what Tim Cook and his team talked about today, there was a lot of talk, of course, about um, you know, the megapixels, there was a lot of talk about the titanium shell and all this. What was the technology that you heard at this event that really jumped out at you as a positive? Yeah, I think one of the biggest positive is their major upgrade for GPU that now support natively run uh, console games. So uh, no smartphones before were able to have such powerful GPUs, hardware accelerated ray tracing to support uh, AAA grade uh, console and PC games. So this is an industry, industry first, definitely a milestone for the role of smartphone in the gaming history. Okay, and just to interrupt for a second, Martin, we have some breaking news. Uh, we can confirm that uh, BP's CEO, Bernard Looney, has resigned with immediate effect. Uh, Looney was said to not be fully transparent in disclosures. The board had received allegations on personal relationships. We don't have any further details than that, but again, uh, this was off the back of an FT report about the CEO of BP resigning, Bernard Looney. It, 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 we now know that Looney was not fully apparent, transparent in disclosures, and the 
the board received allegations on personal relationships. All right, um, we'll follow up on that headline later on. But in the meantime, we are talking to Martin Yang over at Oppenheimer about Apple and the event today. Uh, Martin, when you look at what Apple will, is capable of doing, a lot of excitement, of course, over its services side because that's higher margin and uh, its recurring revenue, and it, it smooths out the revenue stream for the company. What does the upgrade in GPU mean for services for Apple? It has a lot of implications. Uh, so, so services have twofold direct impact. Number one is, uh, this is my speculation, there's a potential to include more uh, AAA grade games into their Apple Arcade services. So that will make that gaming subscription service um, uh, more appealing to not just mobile casual game players, but also you know PC and console hardcore players, and potentially maybe higher pricing tier for the game subscription service. The second impact will be on iCloud. They just introduced new uh, higher storage tiers, 6T and 12T. As we know, uh, those hardcore AAA games are very big and very um, um, will, will, will consume a lot of the storage places. So with more support of those games, uh, users will naturally want to upgrade to higher uh, iCloud Plus service tiers. So Martin, based on everything you heard from this Apple event, are you changing your forecast for unit sales in any way for Apple over the next uh, couple of months? Uh, I am a little bit more optimistic coming off uh, the Huawei Mate uh, 60 release. And now that Apple is not raising prices despite all the major upgrades on the materials and the cameras for the Pro and Pro Max model, I think I feel a little more comfortable uh, about Apple maintaining its market share or less not losing as much to Huawei in the upcoming iPhone 15 cycle. Martin, great to talk to you. Martin Yang over at Oppenheimer, a look at Apple. The shares lower here as they typically tend to be on the day of a new release here. The iPhone 15 pretty much coming in as expected as well uh, as uh, an update on the Apple Watch here. I guess uh, we'll see whether investors sort of end up embracing this uh, a little bit later. I mean, we've seen this cycle before. Apple has these big product announcements. Yeah. The shares usually go down on the day. In fact, that's been the trend. And then maybe a, a week later, once they start to see some sales numbers, pre-sales numbers in, people start embracing the stock. Right. They start yeah. dribbling out all the positive headlines. Um, one question I have is whether uh, all these changes that they're making actually inspires people to go out and buy the new devices because it feels kind of tangential, kind of just on the margins. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to know. I mean, I, I, I think everyone's been looking at Tim Cook now for several years and saying, when is that next big thing, right? Yeah. Because we know Steve Jobs had this You're big flare, on the car. Right? It was the iPod, the phone, all these things, iPad, everything. And then ever since T Cook, I mean, he's, he's done great. I mean, no one could debate that he's created a lot of incremental value, but it's incremental product. And I remember when uh, Tim Cook, I mean, excuse me, when Steve Jobs passed and Tim Cook took over, I remember a lot of analysts I talked to, I was covering this story, said Apple is going to end up like Sony. They didn't necessarily mean that as a compliment. Mm -hmm. They basically said the same thing. When Sony's founder died, he was this huge innovator. They had this cash juggernaut that was going to continue, but the innovation, there was a lot of concern as yeah. to whether they would be able to do it. Interesting to see whether Apple ends up going down that road as well. It has been quite some time. A lot more coverage coming up. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. It's time now for our Wall Street Week daily segment. David Weston, the host of Wall Street Week, joining us as he does every day at this time. A focus on a G20 that yeah. has come and gone. Did we actually learn yeah, anything? We're going to find yeah. that out from a yeah. true expert. He's David Melpass. Mm -hmm. Of course, he has just been the head of the World Bank. David, welcome. It's good to have you back. What about the G20? Did they accomplish what you hope they get accomplished? Hi. Thanks, David and Roman. Um, so they, you know, they meet. It's the culmination of hundreds of meetings during the year. I went to ones earlier in 2023. Uh, uh, they end up with a communique, but uh, and then they break and go on to their other other parts of the world. Important issues that are hanging over the the global South, the developing world, is the debt impasse. Uh, you know they've borrowed lots of money, and now interest rates are going up, so that's a, a huge problem. The relationships with China, uh, the actual and China didn't come at the leader level for this meeting, uh, and the uh, the relationships among the countries. Those are all really important issues. Oil prices and fertilizer and food are, of course, critical uh, problems for people in poorer countries in, in the U.S. too. What about the global south and the poorer countries? Was China's absence, I mean, they had a representative, but President Xi was not there. Did that help or hurt 
uh, Private President Modi make pro progress? Well, I think it leaves the stage more open for Modi so they're not stepping on each other's lines. Uh, but China's doing, I, I think, well in the soft power in the world. If you think of their image, uh, they, keep, uh, they keep showing up uh, when there are crises. Uh, they're, they're filling some of the vacuum uh, in the world. And so I, I think it worked fine for India and fine for China the way they worked it out this time, with China not being there. We've talked a lot on this show about how investors have started to look away from China, EM investors, whether it's to India or other nations. We've also talked about how a lot of businesses that had really staked their fortunes on China have now tried to diversify. You understand the relationship or lack of relationship right now between the U.S. and China. Do you think it can improve? I th I think it, it should, uh, but it's right now deteriorating. There actually is a huge uh, relationship in that there's a giant trading relationship, yes. uh, both directions, but especially from China exporting to the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's also uh, meetings that go on uh, frequently on the international side. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think what's really important is that uh, not only that they communicate, but the world recognizes there needs to be less dependence on China. Yes. By by most countries, yeah. uh, and especially less dependence in critical technologies, military use technologies. Yeah. And so the world's trying to work out how to do that. And we've already seen that in some of the data, I mean, at least with the U.S. and its trading relationship with Mexico, just some new data showing that now Mexico is back to being our top trading partner. Before you got to the World Bank, and you were undersecretary at the Treasury at a time uh, when President Donald Trump was, made it very clear about the U.S. stance on China. And when Biden took over, there was this expectation that he would soften that stance, yet by most measures, he's actually increased that stance on China. Yeah, it's politically difficult yeah. because people want there to be a foreign adversary, and so that's uh, some of what's going on. Also, the U.S. started using tariffs as a, as a way of trying to balance the playing field, the, the commercial playing field, and it's not really a good tool at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so as you think about it, not enough progress was made on the legal structures of the world, the WTO, for example, or the idea of intellectual property protection, and too much was made of these tariffs, which uh, economics is really clear, they subtract from global growth. What about those legal structures, as you call them? We just came up with the BRICS meeting, where they had another 11 countries, we now had, as we've talked about China not going to the G20. What's left of those structures that were created after World War II? Is much left of them at all? Well, to some extent, too much, uh, in that, you know, the original use of uh, IMF and World Bank, IMF was protecting the gold standard. That doesn't uh, exist. Uh, and the World Bank was uh, working to rebuild its, it was called the International Bank for Reconstruction of Europe and Development. Uh, and so, that, the, the, you know, the, there's uh, maybe too much weight put on them. They're actually not not very big. The world has grown way larger uh, than those institutions. And yet, when there's a problem, people say, uh, who are you going to call? Uh, and uh, it's very difficult because the size is just not there to deal with the food crises in, in uh, Africa, with the security, the insecurity in the, in the uh, developing countries, with the debt problem. I, I pushed in the G7 for the G7, that's the seven, seven uh, uh, financially most advanced, I guess, countries, uh, for them to ask and tell the IMF and the World Bank to make more progress on debt. They declined. It's now sitting in the G20 and, and is stalled. It's been stalled for three years, actually for six years. Mm. You've advocated more power, more capacity for international institutions like the World Bank. By the way, you agree with Larry Summers on that. Larry Summers is right there with you. Well, well, Are you wait, making progress in that be, direction? I didn't say more power. What I said is uh, more uh, grants, more grant capacity. Because if you load the countries up with debt, even if it's debt from the IMF and the World Bank, uh, it really disrupts what they're doing. Uh, I think there needs to be more grants, but that's specifically what the advanced countries and their taxpayers don't want to do. So so on that basis, then, you need to rethink this problem and really go after how do you create a better growth environment in the developing countries themselves. The interest rate hikes that are going on right now are uh, one of the biggest problems faced by people around the world. Here you go from a 0% interest rate all the way up to 55 without any positive impact, uh, well, without any uh, progress. 
doesn't help when it's, uh, when it's debt rather than grants. Thanks so much to David Melpass. He's former World Bank president. Tomorrow, we're going to talk with Larry Summers, former U.S. Treasury Secretary, about the latest U.S. CPI data. And on Friday, we'll be joined by Melissa Carney, University of Maryland professor of economics, to discuss the economic advantages of a two-parent household. That's a new book she has coming out. Mm. That will be at 6 p.m. Eastern time in New York. Now, you always have some great uh, conversations, interesting conversations. I'll definitely tune in for that. And be sure to tune in every day around this time where David joins us here for our Wall Street Week daily segment. Here on the close, as we round out into the final hour of trading here on this Tuesday afternoon. Stocks right, right on session lows here. Tech stocks really on the back foot and a little bit of a holding pattern as we await the latest consumer price index data coming out 8.30 a.m. Washington time tomorrow. More market coverage coming up right here on Bloomberg. Almost 3 p.m. here in New York. This is the countdown to the close. Romaine Bostic here alongside Scarlett Fu. And let's get a view from the top, not just from the top of our buildings here at 731 Lexington, but also of the markets. Yeah, let's get right to the markets here. We're talking about stocks right now at session lows here. In fact, a good portion of the individual names actually higher on the day. But when you have Apple, Microsoft, Oracle, Amazon, Tesla, Meta, Adobe, Alphabet, mm -hmm. all lower on the day, well, you're going to get red across the screen. 1% on the NASDAQ right now, about a half a percent on the S&P. Yeah, and of course, uh, the Dow Industrials, little change at the moment. The Russell also marginally higher. What's interesting, of course, is the bank stocks doing better. Uh, they're giving updates at, a different, at different conferences. PNC, for instance, doing well, uh, among others. Yeah, this is uh, conference season, of course, uh, where we get a deluge of these sort of uh, bank conferences. And I think it's interesting. We talk about what we're hearing out of some of these banking and executives, particularly the regional banking executives. And they actually seem to be relatively encouraged uh, by their uh, prospects for better margins and better profitability here. So we'll see. Of course, you know, the proof is in the pudding and we're still a few weeks away from the next yeah. uh, earning seasons of, of reports. Well, you mentioned Apple earlier. I feel like we need to talk about that because the stock is down on its product launch day, which is typical, right? Because we've done the number crunching and the stock has been down in eight of the past 12 years. Uh, I apologize. I, I think I jumped ahead here because yeah, keep you going, to Scarlett, talk about yeah. No, no. no. Um, so Apple is just something I've been paying attention to. But let's go back to this chart. This yeah. is what, volume and Chinese ADRs? Yeah, a lot of talk here right now, I guess, about maybe the potential for some enthusiasm in the IPO market, some new issuance coming to market, and whether that, uh, I guess, has anything to do with increased optimism here. But basically what you're looking at right there is basically the returns that you've had here over the last couple of years, whether it's SPACs, whether it's uh, the Chinese market, or whether it's IPO market indexes tracking them all. Mm. Those are the three lines at the bottom and the line at the top. That's basically the broader market. So if you just bought a, a s and uh, SPY ETF or something, and rode that out, you'd be faring much better. Yeah, well, you might might need to wait a little bit. All right, let's take a look at some of those movers. I mentioned Apple. We can go straight to Oracle, which is down quite a bit. Uh, it's the worst performer in the S&P 500. Analysts basically saying the results failed to live up to high expectations because through yesterday's close, it had gained 57 percent. Oracle? Oracle, yeah. Yeah. Believe well, it or not. Yeah, but I mean, this is about slowing revenue at this point. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, look, I, you know, I know everyone makes this case that, okay, well, this is still a juggernaut. And look, I'm sure Oracle will bounce back. But I mean, look, the numbers don't lie. Yeah. I mean, the fact of the matter is, if you're buying at the multiples, the trajectory has to be up. It can't be down. It was down. It and was that's down. why you're seeing the shares down. And 13%. so maybe they'll need to go outside and yeah. look for acquisitions to keep that growth rate back up um, yeah. to scale the purchases it has made. Yeah. Of course, there was also some M&A that we should uh, keep you apprised of as well. Westrock getting a takeover offer from Smurfit Kappa Group to create a packaging behemoth. Uh, the cash and stock offer priced Westrock at about a 28% premium to yesterday's close. Yeah, um, we talk about, I guess, the idea here of sort of what the sort of becomes the next catalyst for the market. A market, of course, it's maybe been in a bit of a holding pattern as they await the latest economic data. Mm -hmm. Or are they awaiting earnings? Or are they awaiting Jay Powell? Or are they awaiting just some one at a know, time, one at a time from heaven that tells them that now it's okay to buy? CPI first tomorrow, right? And then we'll see what happens after that. Absolutely, we are one hour away from those closing bells. Our cross-platform market coverage on Bloomberg. That coverage just starts right now. Countdown to the close. Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage ahead of the U.S. market close starts right now. This is the countdown to the close. Romaine Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu. We're joined right now by our colleagues Tim Senevic and Jess Menton. Jess Menton in today for Carol Master. Welcome to our audiences across our Bloomberg platforms, television, radio, originals, and YouTube. Tim Senevic here. Tell me something good, Tim. 
tell me, tell me you got the magic here. Yeah. <laughs> it depends on what, what you like, Romaine. Okay, oh. it depends on what you like. Yeah, not you know, much today. I, I, thought of, uh, I thought of you earlier today, Romaine, because yeah. yesterday you mentioned, you added to my list of gainers the, the weed stocks and what the marijuana stocks were doing. And as you a result finally of, went out and smoked a No, no, I didn't. Bowl. But yeah. it's going to get easier yeah. here in New York if it needs to get any easier. Does it? <laughs> That's the big question right that I have. <laughs> I mean, have so you there... walked the streets of New York? It's like a cloud of marijuana <laughs> well, that, smoke everywhere so, you go. So that's actually why I'm glad, I'm glad you, you, you're you don't need, You don't even need to buy it. Is. You can just get high just walking down the street. Well, apparently, not enough places sell marijuana at this point because the legally, states... Yeah. Legally. Okay. Excuse me, legally. Because uh, in my neighborhood, there's like a little... These stores there's, on... There's like a corner. little truck that goes around my neighborhood that is like green and they advertise it. <laughs> like, it's apparently... I don't know what's going on. The gray market, but... Yeah, the, the, the gray market. The, the police don't actually care about it. That's one of the reasons why, though, New York is loosening its marijuana licensing. It's going to expand the recreational market here oh, yeah. and allow some of those uh, big publicly traded companies to yeah. apply to have recreational licenses here. Yeah, and the change means that companies with current medical license in New York can potentially open a recreational dispensary next to the one of their medical dispensaries around the end of this year, but they still need to pay a $20 million fee to apply mm. and meet some other criteria there. $20 million. Something tells me the guys with the, 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 the van... <laughs> you know, on Court Street in Brooklyn, right outside the Trader Joe's, they're not going to be paying 20 million bucks. Outside the Trader I think Joe's. it's the big company that'll be Tim, doing that. I, I really appreciate the specificity there for our audience. <laughs> anyone driving right now uh, down Court Street in Brooklyn here, you know exactly uh, where to go. I guess the big question is, if you keep driving down here, I think at some point you hit an Apple store there, Scarlet Foo. Uh, I don't, I don't know true. what's more expensive right now. Uh, the taxes you pay uh, on buying weed in New York City or buying a new iPhone. And I don't know, how much is the court? Is that like about 20 20 million extra too? That'll be 20 bucks, 30 yeah. bucks, but I think the big headline coming out of the Apple product launch was that the iPhone prices didn't go up unless you're talking about the highest end one. That one goes up by $100, but interesting that Apple decided not to raise prices, uh, even though anyone who does buy this new iPhone, as Romain mentioned, will have to get the new cord. Forget the lightning cord, it's back to the UBC uh, cord, which is the standard across Europe. About time, right? I feel like it. I mean, okay, so do you remember back in, what was it, 2016 when Apple removed the headphone jack? That yeah, was, was outrage. Yeah, I remember that. That was a really big deal. You, I actually, I actually switched to Android because of that at that time. <laughs> did you switch back to iPhone, or are you still? On I Android? did eventually. So, well, yeah. because then Android got all the Android phones got rid of the iPhone. The that iPhone that was a really big deal, so, and that was one. I yeah. heard a rumor about that like a year before that would happen, and I thought to myself, Apple's never going to do that. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Sure enough, they did it, and it, everything's been okay. Uh, I think sort this of. is a, yeah. You just get lower quality audio. audio but lower quality. So <laughs> no, you just have to buy the AirPods. That's what. And it you have to buy that little like dongle I said, too. Lower quality audio, Scarlet Foo. <laughs> Not if you get that dongle, Romaine. You can actually still. <laughs> like I said, know. Tim Senevic, lower quality. Audio. I didn't know you were such an audiophile. I am. Okay. You see, and, that I, makes and sense. I have to suffer through. Actually, I, I, you know what? I actually went out and buy. I had to buy an actual separate player. I, I thought you were going to say you were going to went out and got an, an iPod. Well, they don't sell iPods anymore. Yeah, you could still probably get one. Well, yeah, they sell one for like $20 million. Tim and I apparently <laughs> keep losing our AirPods. So oh, we yeah. feel like that needs to be a big component I'm, there with the segments and <laughs> Yeah, Apple's I think revenue. they got to switch the reporting category for that one to services. Yeah. It's just recurring revenue from all of us who Absolutely. Lose, our, lose our AirPods. <laughs> Did you see? I, you know, I, was, I was looking at the recurring revenue they get from the, the, the devices or whatever yeah. they're calling it now. Uh, I mean, it's a huge part of their business. Huge. I mean, you talk about, I mean, it's more, they make more money off that than they do selling Macs, more money off that than they do selling iPads. Yeah, it's, it's remarkable. We're That's their have, business now. It yeah. should be its own company. Basically, you losing your, your AirPods, Tim, is keeping this business afloat. <laughs> it's happening to me at least two or three times a year. And I'm not even going to get started on how long the battery actually lasts. Like, I wonder you know, if you just go out down year, to Lexington whatever. Avenue and just open up the grates on the sewer, how many AirPods are down there. <laughs> it's probably a lot. I would never even walk over like one of those wearing, and, uh, wearing AirPods. Pizza. Elevator banks AirPods. as well. All right. you know. I'm being told we got to go, guys. But I mean, we do we have, have we're going to have much more coverage on Apple throughout the program. We got Ed Ludlow oh, no. and Mark Gurman joining oh, us a little later in the happens. program. We'll be back together live on TV, radio, and YouTube, and then on Bloomberg Originals as well for 4 p.m.'s Beyond the Bell coverage. We're going to take you through today's market close. Continuing our markets coverage right here on Bloomberg Television. Counting you down to the close. A little more than 50 minutes until we get to those bell. As on a look right now at a recently published uh, feature titled, Where to Invest $100,000 Right Now. In that piece, our reporters asked four experts where they see the best opportunity. Our next guest was one of those experts. Yana Barton, portfolio manager over at Eaton Vance, recommends industrial, saying, quote, focus on the waste, defense, and select transport industry. John, Yana joining us right now for a little bit more on that. And Yana, I guess on the surface, this makes sense. What's the case? 
Uh, well, the good news, you asked for the good news, is that we've had a cap-weighted distortion in the marketplace where you have a market that's up 18 percent, but less than 27 percent of stocks are actually outperforming, which creates this valuation and our earnings dispersion, which we would like as active investors to participate in. So the value in the market is pretty much in the eight sectors that have been laggard, um, and one of which is industrials. And I will say it's the fourth best performing sector year to date, but it trails in comparison to that of tech, consumer, and comp services. Industrials also happens to be a sector where there is a high stock-specific risk, so there are, there are a lot of idiosyncratic stories, um, and valuation makes sense there, which is why we like that sector. We also like healthcare quite a bit for the same reasons, mm -hmm. um, and we like utilities, so a little bit of defense and offense, uh, depending on what the flavor you choose. Well, what about, I guess, the elephant in the room, which, of course, you is tech, big tech, if you, if you want to sort of put that moniker on it here. You, you find anything attractive there? Absolutely. We actually like uh, tech. Um, you know, you bring up a really good point, which is 60 percent of the sector right now resides in three stocks, um, and unfortunately, they do drive 17 percent of the cap of the overall index. But there are long-term secular trends that we still like, uh, one of which is security. If you think about network and cloud security, it's a $40 billion market opportunity growing at 12 um, percent relative to what Gartner is predicting. So it's a big market that creates a lot of opportunity as we're moving more and more to the cloud, and it's important to kind of ensure that the security security is uh, up to snuff across the board. Another opportunity that I don't think is going away, and although it has been very strong year to date, is semiconductors. Uh, semiconductor equipment continues to be the enabler of next gen uh, transformative uh, technology, um, and we, we really like some of the plays there as well. So, um, you know, we know that NVIDIA has done a lot of work, but there are a lot of other names within the space that we are uh, trafficking in. So technology remains an opportunity. You have to be selective. Yeah. Well, certainly, when you look at something like NVIDIA, looking for um, you know the, the follow-up to NVIDIA. What about tech-adjacent names that um, get lumped together with big tech, but obviously belong to other sectors? I'm thinking Amazon with consumer discretionary, uh, same for Tesla or Meta, which is part of communication services. Um, those are still names uh, that populate our portfolios, and we've been investors in those stocks for a very long time. If you do want adjacent markets, I would point uh, folks to healthcare. While it is um, thought of as a defensive space, it has lagged the market. It's second biggest um, uh, sector of the market, uh, but it's been second worst performing um, market uh, or performer year to date, and it's lagging the uh, S&P 500 by over 19 percentage points. Mm -hmm. Biotechnology which obviously has a growth rate that is uh, significantly above that of maybe like a healthcare service industry or others, is also trading at a 7 percent discount um, to the market. So you have a sector that's trading at a discount, an industry that's trading at a discount, and by the way, um, you know, it's growing earnings. So that industry is predicted to grow next year double digits with a free cash flow yield in excess of 5 percent. So growth and valuation support is really something you want to be looking for there. And Yana, we were talking earlier about the IPOs that are expected to come out over the coming days, uh, clearly with Arm Holdings, the first one out there, and then Instacart. How are you thinking about that, about making room in your portfolios for these new issuances? Well, um, valuation ultimately matters. Based on the, on the work that our analysts have done, uh, some of them are coming out at valuations that we think are lofty. Uh, so while we're intrigued by the fundamental story, you know, ultimately um, everything has a price that we're willing to pay. And at current levels, it seems a little bit excessive. So mm. we'll see how it prices and how it behaves, and we'll go from there. I, I am curious, Yana, just about the whole idea of price discovery in this market, how reliable it is, given that it seems everyone has such a vastly different opinion about where we are in the business cycle, the economic cycle, the rate hiking cycle, and whether we're in a bull or bear market. I mean, we can't even agree on that right now. <laughs> How about we say that we're in late cycle of some sort? Um, you know, and, and the truth is, you're absolutely right. Depending on the day that you wake up, you know, there is a rhetoric that kind of overwhelms the market, and the market is up or down, depending on what the mood of the investor base is. You know, um, if you think about where we are right now, September, unfortunately, happens to be one of the worst performing uh, months uh, in the year for the market. Uh, I think over the past 10-year period, you've seen a decline of over 1.5%. So, 
the reason why I mentioned that is while we're very constructive in the market for the rest of the year and into 2024, um, it, volatility is here to stay. And I think for investors, that is the opportunity. And I guess as you talk about price discovery, there's plenty of these dispersions that are taking place. And we would really urge investors to look in the areas of the market that have lagged to date. And as I mentioned to you, eight out of 11 sectors are trading at valuations that are at a discount to S&P 500. Um, so those are the opportunities you want to go after. Mm -hmm. The other thing that you want to do is you really want to expand your uh, horizon, you know, extend it. Um, so let's think in years and not in months or quarters. All right, Yana Barton, I'm looking at the worst performer, performing sector of the year. It is utilities, which uh, you say are a good buy right now. Yana Barton is portfolio manager and director of specialty solutions over at Eaton Vance, joining us from Boston. Now coming up, who is the new bond king? Bill Gross says it's certainly not Jeffrey Gunlock. We're going to hear why the co-founder of PIMCO is blasting the CEO of Double Line Capital. Yeah, and a new king in the corrugated storage box industry here. West Rock and Smurfit set to tie up here. That's our stock of the hour coming up in just a bit. And moving forward, also, we're going to tell you the inside story behind a $2.3 billion giant sphere that will open soon in Las Vegas. Do you know who it's backed by? Yeah, that, that guy who owns the Knicks, right? Yeah, the yeah, billionaire who owns the Knicks. So I'm sure it'll be great. All that and more coming up. This is Bloomberg. As we march to the close here, you see the downdraft from Apple, Microsoft, Meta, Oracle, Adobe, Tesla, Amazon, the Magnificent Seven. In fact, all of the big cap tech names here moving lower on the day, and that's putting a lot of downward pressure on the broader market. Is there green on the screen? Sure. But when you have Chevron, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Intel higher on the day, that's just not going to be enough to move this market any meaningfully higher. The next big catalyst, of course, on deck. Well, it's going to be the macro once again here. The CPI report, 8.30 a.m. tomorrow. We'll see if that changes the direction of this market at all potentially here. It's down about six tenths of a percent right now on the S&P 500. The yield space still kind of in that holding pattern as well. Once we get some clarity here on whether there is a reacceleration in that headline CPI number, whether there is a sense here that the Fed might actually have to do more, and more importantly, whether there's a sense here and whether another revaluation in this market needs to take place to keep things in check. Energy prices moving higher, not helping matters. 89 bucks a barrel right now on WTI crude. Brent still holding at that 90 bucks a barrel level. Level. Once again, the bright spots on the day, you'll find that in the financial space, some relatively encouraging commentary coming out of several key executives there uh, about the potential for improvement in margins. Let's bring Abigail Doolittle into this conversation as we do every day at this time for our Options Insight segment. And Abigail, you're taking a look at the rate environment right now and whether higher for, so higher for longer is actually going to hold. Uh, it's a tough question, Romaine, because as I was producing uh, this segment, all of the boards that I was putting together, they are just mind-blowing, really. They're unbelievable. In a lot of cases, we have yields moving up about the same amount as the yields themselves. So, for instance, that two-year yield over the last couple of years uh, up just almost 5%. That's not probably a relationship or a dynamic that many people are talk taught in finance, business schools, or other related classes. Let's bring in Carly Garner, founder of uh, De Carly Trade. And Carly, help us here. I know that you've been talking for a while uh, that we might see uh, yields come in. Frankly, when I listen to the Federal Reserve, I don't see or hear any support for that. I think that they are staying pretty firm and maybe longer than and possible. And when I look at the charts, technically, I can definitely make a case for yields to go higher yet. But you have tons of experience. You've had so many great calls. And you do at some point think that we will see some sort of reversal back down. I do. I, I, the thing about this business is the markets are in the business of creating the most amount of pain to the highest number of people. And so we have to keep our mind open. If everybody is uh, thinking in one general way, generally the markets have a surprise in store for them. And I think that's kind of what we're on the cusp of. If you remember, uh, tw it wasn't that long ago we were talking about $100 crude oil and $8 natural gas was the new normal, higher for longer, everybody said. And nobody predicted 
uh, $2 natural gas and $60 oil, but that's exactly what happened. And so it, it's very possible that something could surprise us, some event or story that's around the corner that pushes things the other way. Well, actually, correction, because I think that you did predict a $60 <laughs> barrel uh, when oil was going negative and was in single digits. You were saying it was going to be at 40 soon, and I know you had that great short call on yeah. natural gas. So, you know, it's hard to predict the future uh, in terms of events, for sure. I would say that sometimes price charts can be a helpful guide. What kind of event? Because when I take a look at the uh, work function in the Bloomberg terminal, it's showing 1% uh, or more of cuts next year. I'm not hearing that from the Federal Reserve at all. It seems very clear to me that they want to stay around longer uh, to make sure that we don't see a repeat of the 70s, sticky inflation. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, we do have uh, these cuts priced in. The only way I can make sense of that is some sort of recession. Do you agree with that? Or what, what kind of event do you think could actually yeah. uh, cause a big rally in bonds? Right. It's difficult to predict what could be around the corner. No one saw COVID coming, and, and look what happened there. I will say this. Um, the Fed, it, they haven't hinted at, at any type of policy change, but that's kind of how they, they operate. That's how they've behaved in the past, and suddenly we turn on a dime. If you remember, uh, inflation was transitory, and they didn't need to raise rates, and then suddenly it, the opposite thing is happening. And global, uh, global central bankers have gotten in a really bad habit of trying to control the business cycle. So it's been really easy that, for them to stick the course now because everything's looking pretty rosy. But if things start to crack, that's going to change quickly. So very quickly, Carly, in about 30 seconds or so, how do you play this using Treasury futures? So you can buy a March 114 call option on the 10-year note. It's only about $750, $800. So that's your total risk. No matter what happens, that's all you, you can lose. And if something does happen between now and the next 164 days, which I think probably uh, is in the cards, you have theoretically unlimited profit potential. There's no margin. So it's a really uh, slow way and low risk way to play the upside in treasuries. Terrific perspective, as always, on uh, one of the wildest markets out there over the last couple of years. Carly Garner, founder of DeCarly Trading, uh, thank you for joining us for Options Insight today. And from New York, this is Bloomberg. If you're heading to Las Vegas anytime soon, the city's latest draw is not a casino. It's a 366-foot tall sphere. And there it is. There's the sphere. A lot of people were confused by initially while it was under construction, Romaine. They thought it looked like the Death Star. But this is what it looks like in all its glory after it launched on July 4th. And you can really see that they began to decorate the outside with images of cloud stars. I mean, there's planet Earth. It's massive. Yeah, I mean, this has been a long time coming, and actually, I think it looks pretty cool. I mean, I haven't seen it in person, but at least from the uh, what we've been seeing on video here, and it's kind of fitting, I think, with uh, what you see on the strip in terms of mm. all about the spectacle, particularly yes. when it comes to the lights and everything else, and this just kind of amps it up to another level. So, honestly, to all the other casino owners and uh, event, uh, venue owners out there in Las Vegas, they need to step their game up. <laughs> it's your move, right? Well, this is an event venue. It's got 17,500 seats. Um, the interior is wallpapered with high-resolution LED screens. Yeah. And of course, and uh, facial recognition software to make sure everyone comes. Well, out yes, and you're referring to the fact that the, you can't have Spike Lee in there. This right? is James Dolan's uh, yeah. new pet project, and yes, the owner of the New York Knicks and the New York Rangers and of Madison Square Garden. Yeah. Uh, you two will be kicking off uh, its concert series on September 29th, and I believe it's basically sold out. You and, too. Yeah, you too. <laughs> Throwback. Okay. All right. Um, I mean, that's one way to go. Uh, but I mean, look, it's a cool facility. I mean, we, you know, I mean, just take Dolan out of the, the conversation right now. It's a cool facility, at least the outside of it. I haven't seen the inside. But, you know, look, I mean, this is what Vegas is about, right? Yeah. I mean, you don't go to Vegas for boring. You go for the spectacle. And you can and, go to and, London for one, too. And, it's, and, they're building one there. Dolan's building one there? In London, yeah. Oh. A sphere. I don't know if it's going to be the same size, but it's under construction. Who's going to be the first uh, artist there? It's like that's Oasis. a good question. Are they still around? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> This is the countdown to the close. About 30 minutes left to go here on what is, well, not necessarily a great trading day. It's been meandering, and yeah. we meandered our way lower, at least for the broader market right now. The S&P 500 down about six-tenths of 1%. And you can see among the different sectors that clearly a lot more decliners than advancers led by technology. A lot of that is really Apple. Communication services also lowered by more than 1% on the 
upside, you do have energy stocks gaining 2% as a group as oil prices continue moving higher. And a couple of financials, uh, Zions and PNC among them, uh, as they are talking about their prospects at conferences. And utilities, clearly a defensive sector, a classic defensive sector, up by about one-tenth of 1% 1 remains. It's interesting you mentioned the regional banks because the commentary we got out of PNC and Zions, Scarlett, it was very good. But then you had some commentary out of Northern Trust and a couple others. It was, wasn't necessarily good. Right now, David Solomon speaking uh, at that uh, uh, Barclays conference over at Goldman Sachs, of course, uh, one of the biggest of the big banks out there here. Be interesting to see how this all shakes out, particularly when we get back to earnings season, which is, quite frankly, just a few weeks away. As for the day, you see PNC up about 5%. That's one of the big bright spots on the day, as is the energy space. But the big Magnificent Seven stocks, the big cap tech stocks, not getting any help there. At least six of those seven stocks lower on the day, including Amazon down by about a percent. A couple other bright spots out there. Keep an eye on Endeavor Group and TKO. This is a new entrance coming to the market today, a big IPO today. Remember, this is the mashup when it bought uh, World uh, WWE, the big wrestling uh, entertainment company here, now listed under the ticker uh, TKO under this new deal. Endeavor also getting a boost on that, up about a percent on the day. And Casey's General Stores, that's actually one of your best performers today in the S&P 500, up 10 percent here on the back of earnings. Uh, revenue was pretty much in line with estimates, but a big beat when it comes to EPS. I do want to go back to the broader market, the global market, I should say, particularly when it comes to emerging emerging markets in China. This chart was actually flagged to me yesterday, and I thought this was interesting. We talk about investor appetite for Chinese stocks, for anything Chinese right now. We had that Bank of America survey, Scarlett, that you were talking about at the top of the show in 2A, showing that at least among the fund managers of Bank of America surveys, well, everyone has started to shun China in a big way, and you see that reflected here. You're taking a look at two ETFs here. One is basically a emerging market ETF that includes China, and one is one that includes that excludes China, I should say. You can pretty much tell which is which here. The divergence has been pretty remarkable here. As a lot of people say, there's a lot of investment opportunities in the emerging market space, just not with China. Yeah, avoiding China becoming a very popular common trade out there right now. Uh, let's broaden our perspective here and talk a little bit about the Treasury market bonds, because when it comes to whether there's a new bond king in town, Bill Gross is pretty certain of one thing. Jeff Gunlock does not carry that crown. The PIMCO co-founder spoke on a live recording of our Odd Lots podcast. To be a bond king or queen, you need a kingdom. You need a kingdom. Okay, PIMCO had $2 trillion. Okay, Double Lines got like $55 billion. That's no kingdom. That's like Latvia or, or Estonia. Then look at his record for the last five, six, seven years. How does 60th percentile smack of a bond king? It doesn't. Within the last hour, Jeff Gunlock did respond at the Future Proof Conference saying, quote, I don't care, adding that their five-year numbers are great and that he hopes Gross feels better about himself. Wow. Joining us now are the hosts of Odd Lots, Bloomberg's Joe Weisenthal and Tracy Alloway. Guys, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to speak with us. Uh, Tracy, I will come to you first. What is up with the, the backstory here between Bill Gross and Jeff Gunlock? I mean, th those were fighting words from Bill Gross and the response as well from Jeff Gunlock. What's the backstory there? <laughs> Well, uh, I, I think uh, Bill has talked about this before, but basically when he was ousted from PIMCO, he went to Jeff and kind of, you know, knocked on his house and was like, hey, what if we teamed up together? What if what's better than one Bond King? It's two Bond Kings. So let's do something together. And Jeff basically turned him down. And from what I heard from Bill, he then proceeded to sort of criticize him in various social spheres uh, for the next 12 months. So when we spoke to Bill on stage at the Future Proof Conference yesterday, he was very emphatic that this was his chance to get back at Jeff and wreak his revenge. And I got to say, it seems like no one can hold a grudge quite like Bill Gross. Yeah, that might be the understatement of the day, Tracy. I mean, Bill has uh, a lot of bones to pick, and he's never shy about picking them. Uh, Joe Weisenthal, you're also out there at the Future Proof Conference here. And we talk about the response from Gunlack, the idea that, yeah. oh, he doesn't care. Oh, he never really wanted the Bond King title. You believe that? Well, so <laughs> his first answer was like, oh, I don't <laughs> care. But then he kept saying different versions of that. So he clearly cares, and then he responded to the point about performance. And then he responded to the point about AUM. He said, oh, our AUM is more than $55 million. It's actually, it peaked at $150 billion. It's currently around $100 million. So there is clearly uh, both of them really engaged in whatever this, you know, the true source yeah. of the dispute is. 
Uh, but it is. It was very. It was very. I was in the audience. I watched the gunlock thing. I, I very much enjoyed. Uh, seeing the back and forth. Well, one thing that, that I'm curious about, Tracy, is, I mean, once you get past sort of the sensationalism of the comment that uh, Bill Gross made here, there is an underlying, I, I thought, point that he made, which is the idea that he became the Bond King, not just only because of his acumen, but it was really just kind of an unprecedented time for the Treasury market that was just sort of ripe for the picking, particularly when he founded PIMCO back in whatever it was, was the early 70s there. And he really sort of rode a wave that, quite frankly, gun lack, for better or for worse, didn't really catch until it was more late cycle. Oh, absolutely. And I think Bill is kind of upfront about that. If you ask him, well, his point about there no longer being any bond kings or queens was all about, well, the Fed's in control of the bond market now. So it's really difficult to make your name as a trader or investor in that sphere. And if you talk to him, if you ask him directly, do you think you were so successful because your career basically coincided with this amazing 40-year bull run in bonds? He'll be pretty upfront about it. The other thing that I thought was kind of interesting is, of course, uh, he's managing his own money now. He's basically in retirement. And we asked him what was in his portfolio now. He's not really investing in bonds anymore. He said something like 40 percent of his portfolio is now in master limited partnerships, MLPs. So he himself has sort of uh, defected from the debt sphere. Interesting. I did not realize that. So, uh, Joe, as we put this all together, I mean, we, we yeah. started off with this idea of who's the new Bond King. Does anyone in the market see um, Jeff Goodluck as the new Bond King, or has the market also said, you know what, there is no Bond King, it's not possible, it's yeah. always going to be the Fed? Yeah, I think, the, I think the latter. I mean, I don't think, like, anyone is really that excited about the bond market. And look, if, you know, you're just talking about it. 40 years, you have this huge bull market. And you can only make so much money when the line starts turning down. And, you know, these things go in long shifts. And, of course, that's no guarantee that we're going to have a long bear market bounce. Who knows? But, like, right, like, so we had this huge bear market for, like, you know, several years going up to the, you know, late 70s. And, like, Bill started or really got going at Pinko, then the other direction. Yeah. So I think right now, and, you know, the fact is, is, like, Bill clearly is interested in other aspects of the market. He was, like, talking more about, you know, NVIDIA and NVIDIA earnings and the AI boom and master limited partnerships and merger arbitrage of, like, Microsoft Activision and all these things seem to clearly, like, get him more excited currently than talking about bonds. And, of course, stamps. Let's not forget stamps. Uh, Joe Weisenthal <laughs> right. and Tracy Alloway, thank you I'm so sorry, much. Who, who's the king of the Odd Lots podcast or the king or queen? Is the it king Joe and queen. or Tracy? King Should, and queen. Uh, is there? Okay. I, think I, it's I mean, I don't, wanna, I don't want to get them no, in trouble. No, king and queen. Okay, all right. The it's reigning monarchs. Podcast. How about that? This is actually one of the best podcasts. I mean, I mean this all, sin in all sincerity. This is actually one of the best podcasts. Well, there. a lot of people think uh, so. Yeah. It's it, it does yeah. very well. And, of course, you can check out yeah. Odd Lots uh, wherever you get your podcasts. And Tracy, of course, is the smarter of the two. I would go, I would agree with that. Sorry, Joe. All right, coming up, uh, the king. What did you say earlier? It was great. The king of the packaging world. The king. Yeah. There's the, a new king. Smur Smurf at Kappa Group. Smurf at Kappa Group. It's uh, merging with Westrock. We don't really have the terms of the deal um, uh, satisfying a lot of people. People are kind of scratching their heads over it. We're going to discuss this in greater detail next in our stock of the hour. Are we the kings and queens here? Today? No, we're paupers. It's time now for our stock of the hour, a look at the packaging company Smurfit Kappa, down about 10% in Dublin trading after an agreement to merge with Westrock. Analysts were quick to weigh in with Ken Accord Genuity calling the deal a win for Westrock shareholders since, of course, they get to combine their lower margin business with Smurfit's higher margin business. Bloomberg's Cameron Leach joining us right now to talk a little bit more about this. And Cameron, uh, we see the share reaction here, which isn't unusual. Usually yeah. you see the acquirer shares go down, but this is a pretty significant downdraft. A lot of investors are sort of scratching their heads as to why a company would buy a less profitable company. Yeah, let's dive into the rationale here. Uh, from my understanding and based off the reporting conversations I've had, it seems like the Smurfett family wants to take money off the table. Uh, for Westrock, the management there, it allows them to give a sign to investors that, hey, we are doing something. Mm -hmm. If you pull the stock back for about a year or even more than that, you can see that the stock has kind of traded sideways a little bit. So I think this gives them an opportunity of an out to say, hey, guys, yeah. we're working here. Everyone looks busy. Everyone looks productive. How did this deal come to be? Had they been in talks for a while? 
That's a great question. I, want, I don't want to get into too many details there, but I, I do want to say that the Smurfit family truly wanted to get money off the table here. Uh -huh. And I think just based off of uh, those initial, that as the foundation, that's why you see both of these boards are very intent on making this deal happen. For yeah, sure. they made it very clear. Is there any reason to think regulators might look into this? Oh, for sure. <laughs> uh, just seeing how big of uh, these two conglomerates coming together, uh, I think that's going to be a major focus for getting this deal closed. You also need 75% of the shareholders to approve this as well too and there's still a conversation about what assets might they want to divest to kind of you know kind of curtail some of that um i guess the scrutiny from antitrust as well too i am curious we haven't seen a, a tremendous amount of m a activity in this space here yeah. is this going to be a harbinger of things to come uh, at least we hope so it keeps me yeah. a little bit more busier yeah uh, but i think you know with everyone coming off of labor day or holiday if you're in the uk as well too i think uh, people are a little bit more antsy to get something done. I think even based off of conversations with some of the banks and the private lenders as well, too, mm -hmm. I think we'll see a pickup in Q4. Do you think we would have seen a different market reaction at the premium with Rest Rock? I think it was something like a 30% premium over uh, the, the closing price before the announcement. That's a pretty hefty premium for a company yeah. that really hasn't had the track record to justify it. Yeah, great question, too. And I, I think originally they were only supposed to get only a 10% premium, and I think they wound up getting a little bit more than that as well, too. So I think uh, investors are a little bit antsy about that one but I think just giving the market and just to make this deal go over the hump they gave them a little bit more they padded the books all right Cameron Leach our M&A reporter taking a look at what could potentially be a pretty big deal should it go through here the tie-up between Smurfit Kappa and West Rock here the reaction in the shares opposite directions West Rock up three percent on the day Smurfit over in uh, Dublin where its base was down about ten percent in that session there we are moving closer to the closing bells just about 15 minutes to go a conversation coming up here Scarlett with Bob Dahl chief investment officer over across Mark Global. Yeah, as we look at a market that has found a direction, it is down for now as we await the CPI da data tomorrow that could set some direction for the Federal Reserve and what it does next. Yeah, meanwhile, the weakness continues out here in the market. Our full coverage coming up here as we take you to the Bell and Beyond. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Romain Bostic here alongside Scarlett Fu, counting you down to those closing bells. Scarlett, about 10 minutes to go. Stock's pretty much still around uh, session lows. Yeah, and of course, Apple's product launch took place today. And now that it's ended, the stock has fallen near its lows. That is dragging down the broader market overall as well. Um, treasuries were mixed before the CPI report tomorrow, which may or may not give us any clue into what the Fed's next move will be, which is probably at this point a pause. Yeah, but I'm sure we'll pontificate on it uh, fully here, of course, full Guaranteed. market coverage on Bloomberg sale, uh, surveillance tomorrow. You mentioned Apple being a big drag here, uh, down uh, almost uh, 2% here on the day. But all those magnificent seven stocks in the red mm -hmm. today, big part of the reason why you see the broader market in the red. And you do wonder here, I mean, about when people come in and start buying these names, it seems less about, oh, we're buying into a growth story. It's more, it seems like it's a defensive play. And then they sell it off when they get skittish about whatever, yeah. you know, whether they It's somewhere to Apple park thing. your money because you know yeah. that it's safe. Um, but beyond that, it's pretty expensive. Uh, we had a chart earlier that showed uh, tech as a group, two standard deviations above the 10-year average right now. Oh, standard deviations. Look yeah. at you. Yeah. All right. Uh, Multisyllabic words sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get some insights uh, out of our next guest. Bob Dahl joining us right now to help us count down to the close. He's the chief investment officer over at Crossmark Global Investments. And, Bob, uh, I, I do want to start off, of course, uh, with uh, the big report that we're going to get tomorrow on uh, consumer prices here. Uh, and the underlying concern, I guess, amongst a lot of investors is the idea that the Fed might not actually be done. I mean, I think we all sort of hoped and wished after that last meeting that that was it. We've gotten all the rate hikes and now it's just a matter of time before the Fed started to ease. But at least based on what economists are forecasting, they may not have the luxury of easing. I agree with you. Um, that is to say, the Fed's had a 2 percent inflation target for some time now. And while inflation's come down nicely, it's nowhere near two. Uh, oil prices have uh, you know, headed back up. Um, and so there's sticky parts of inflation, wages probably going to be there. Look, I think tomorrow we'll get a mixed report. A lot of things will be behaved. 
oil price is probably up, and so we'll get a number that's uh, not so sure it's uh, the Fed finished. My guess is they'll go one more time before the end of the year. But what's more important than whether the Fed's done or not is what have they already done to the economy by raising rates from zero to five and a quarter in 18 months? Those leads and lags are unpredictable. And my guess is we've only begun to see economic weakness from those actions. There's been a lot of discussion, though, at least the Fed would, would make this argument. And I know Jay Powell has said this at one of the press conferences in the past, this idea that if they weren't as aggressive as they had been, then the impact of inflation on consumers would have been much worse. And we've already seen some data, Bob, uh, showing that just overall on an inflation-adjusted basis, uh, household net worths, household incomes actually declined last year uh, pretty significantly here. So there's this idea that while a lot of people are getting raises, a lot of people are, at least on the surface, in a better position financially, the inflation is just eating away at those gains. No question about it. Now, remember, the Fed waited a long time to get started. The whole debate is inflation transitory or not, and it's clear it wasn't just transitory. So they had to make up for lost time and, and, and got moving pretty quickly, as you point out. Um, but of course, with uh, the stock market up this year, home prices doing reasonably well. A lot of those net worth numbers have moved back up, Romaine. So uh, I think um, that consumers are probably feeling pretty good. Many of them still have excess cash from the pandemic, although that's winding down fast, too. Yeah, definitely. I, I want to go back to that idea, though, that when we look at the costs accrued from 18 months of rate hikes uh, by the Federal Reserve, obviously there's a lot of concern about increased debt defaults. And I thought higher rates was supposed to discourage borrowing. But if you saw what happened right after Labor Day, um, companies were taking advantage of narrow spreads. They were definitely launching plenty of bond sales. Why are credit markets still so active despite all the Fed has done, despite the Fed's best intentions to slow things down? Uh, great observation or great question. I think part of it is that spreads are tight, so corporations are taking advantage of those relatively tight numbers. And of course, there are a lot of people who use the word recession in their vocabulary earlier this year that disbanded with that. So if we're not going to have a recession, well, I guess I can go borrow some money. I'm sure some have operated on that principle. Mm -hmm. uh, but we still have to get through this period of maximum impact on economic growth as a result of that massive increase in short-term rates. So are all these corporate bond sales that we've been seeing a good thing, all these companies loading up on more debt, or does it set us up for a bigger problem or a problem later on? Scarlett, I, I think the problems are going to come more in the small business area. I mean, August, we saw bankruptcies from prior year up uh, about 50 percent. So it's not uniform across the board that things are healthy. Small businesses, which create all the new jobs on a net basis, are, are struggling a bit. We still have the commercial real estate issue we've gotten through. So, uh, yes, there's been a lot of borrowing, but underneath the surface, we've got some issues. Uh, when we talk about, I guess, the corporate fundamentals, Bob, and the idea that we came into this year, everyone sort of expected we were going to really see a lot of pain uh, on the, uh, the earnings front, and we didn't necessarily get that, at least not in the broadest sense here. We're heading into another earnings season in a few weeks, Bob, and I think by most estimates, we're still expecting a lot of these companies to still post relatively decent margins. There's no question the first two quarters of this year, I'll put it this way, earnings came in less bad than feared. They were down both quarters, make no mistake about it, but not down as much as people thought. And in fact, in the last two or three months, we started to see full year numbers move up a bit. That's the first time we can say that in a while. And that's a function of economic growth's been pretty good. My guess is with the cost pressures that we've just talked about, we're going to see some pressure on corporate profit margins. So I'm a concern one more time that the earnings are probably not going to make the up quarter that people are hoping for in uh, quarter three. So if you add that all up, uh, we were talking about how the Bank of America Global Fund Manager Survey showed that a lot of investors are betting against Chinese stocks. Where are they going? They're going into U.S. stocks, specifically big tech. Where does that leave us with that outlook you've just given on corporate earnings and uh, this, this propensity to double down on U.S. stocks, particularly big tech? So I throw into the equation a scarlet valuations. Um, values, valuations are not inexpensive. Remember, interest rates and inflation are no longer zero. Uh, when they were, having PEs uh, over 20 times made sense, but not so much now. So I think a lot of that money that's come running in is going to need to see the fundamentals and the earnings come through at 
or better than expected to sustain uh, these levels. If we see some economic weakness, if we some, see some earnings weakness, my guess is we'll move to the lower end of this 4,200 to 4,600 trading range that we've been in for, uh, seems like forever, months anyway. Bob Dahl over at Crossmark. Always appreciate your insights as we count down Thank to you. the closing bells. About two and a half minutes to go, Scarlett, with all of the big cap tech names on the back foot. And of course, that means the broader market on the back foot as well. Yeah, the NASDAQ 100 and the S&P 500 each hovering right around their 50-day moving average. Yeah, we're seeing that break below those short-term moving averages here. The oscillations continue as we move closer to the closing bell. Full market coverage as we take you to the bell and beyond. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu. We're counting you down to the closing bell and here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast with Tim Stenevic and Jess Menton. Welcome to our audiences across all of our Bloomberg platforms. Coming off a day yesterday, Tim, where we saw the NASDAQ 100 rally 1%. All that being taken back today with the NASDAQ 100 down 1%. Yeah, you know, give and take, right? That's what happens. Hey, we just had a really, I don't know, kind of a downer conversation. Catherine Krantz uh, over at the Center for Macro Specialist Designation, here's what she told us. She thinks that even though we're a year away from the lows of last October on the S&P 500, she doesn't think the lows are actually in for this cycle. She's very concerned about what 2024 looks like and says it's not going to be a good year. October 12th was that closing low for the S&P 500 last year. But if you are an investor and you missed out almost a year out, I mean, these are double digit gains in the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ 100. But yet when you look over what's happening with money market funds, especially with where yields are, you still have a lot of people, especially with money market funds being at a record at around yeah. 5.6 trillion, I, people still sort of skeptical of this. I rally. am curious. So when we talk about this is the first time I've heard people, Scarlett, talk about these October lows. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, we're talking about a downdraft of like like 20 percent to get back down there on the S&P. No, that's a really good point. I mean, yeah. I think a, a lot of people might have missed out on what had been an unexpected advance, and they're wondering whether it's still they still have time to maybe get in on this a little bit here. Yeah, I mean, interesting, though, on this day where we're seeing the Nasdaq really take it on the chin. The S&P only down a fractionally on the day, but believe it or not, the Dow holding up relatively unchanged on the day. The Russell similar as well. And the S&P 400 mid caps actually in the green, though only fractionally. You put it all together, once again, a mixed market. You could call it a holding pattern, if you will, as we wait, of course, for tomorrow, 8.30 a.m. Washington time, that big CPI report. Here are the numbers here as we wait for them to settle. The Dow Jones Industrial Average down roughly 16 points. We're going to call that basically unchange as we wait for the numbers to settle. The S&P down 25 points or about six tenths of a percent while the Nasdaq composite is lower by about 144 points or one percent on the day. And the Russell 2000 as we speak again waiting for these numbers to settle poking into the green. Looks okay. like it's going to finish with a fractional gain a tenth of a tenth hmm. of a percent. There's a little hey we'll take it. There's a little bit of green on the screen. Taking a deeper look at the S&P 500. It's called picking up pennies in front of a steamroller. Yeah that's true. 212 <laughs> stocks moving higher. 287. Uh, Scarlett in the S&P declining today. All right, let's take a look at how the S&P 500 stacks up when you break it down by 24 industry groups. Energy in the lead there up by 2.3 percent with all 23 big cap energy names higher on the day as oil prices climb. Uh, WTI approaching $89 a barrel. Banks also doing pretty well, led by the likes of Zions and PNC as they make comments at an industry conference. On the flip side, software and services, that's Oracle. Oracle dragging that group lower household and and uh, personal products also lower by about 2% on the day. Yeah, Scarlett hitting the nail on the head when it comes to the gainers uh, that I picked for today. Let's start with uh, ExxonMobil, that rally in oil stocks today, sending energy, uh, oil I should say, sending energy companies higher. Shares of ExxonMobil higher by close to 3% on the day today. On a points basis, the best performer in the S&P 500, I should note Chevron up there as well. Let's take a look at shares of Westrock uh, moving higher on some M&A news. Jumping as high as 7% earlier in the session, they're closing higher by 2.76%. This after Smurf at Kappa and Westrock agreed to combine. That forms a packaging giant worth around 20 $20 billion. We should note this comes at a time when there are some concerns about demand when it comes to container board prices coming down as well. Uh, West Rock shares finishing the day higher by more than 2.7%. And then those regional banks actually having a good day. PNC Financial Services Group, Scarlet, as you mentioned, shares rallying there, outperforming the broader market. Uh, there were some sector presentations at the Barclays Global Financial Services Conference. There, we heard from William Demchak. He said on a call that net interest income is expected to decline slightly 
will be toward the low end of the 3 to 4 percent range that was previously stated. He did also mention, Jess, a structural program on expenses that will be announced on earnings day. Shares higher for PNC by 5.8 percent. I have to, of course, point to Apple when I am doing the decliners falling just under 2 percent. So this is its worst day just since last Thursday. But to put into context, historically, when Apple does have big product releases, initially those haven't really always pushed shares higher. So we have to see how things react over the next couple of days or so. But another stock. Did you order a new iPhone, Jess? I probably am going to because the battery on mine is not very good at this moment. Go. And maybe, you know what, a pair of I AirPods, like well, Tim and I were talking uh, about earlier. Because... Start the rally. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Suckers. All got them so in. they're going to be getting my money again soon here. I can't get out <laughs> of this. You have to take out a loan for that. <laughs> Oracle. So ticker symbol ORCL, this quite a move here, shedding more than 13%. So this is its worst close in more than two decades. So the worst since March of 2020 uh, there. And also when you're looking at what's happening, or excuse me, the worst since you March of 2002. 2000. <laughs> it's so, every time we say March of 2020, it's always, always comes off this tongue because of the pandemic there. But I meant March of 2002 there for Oracle, but that obviously coming since the software company reported disappointing revenue late Monday and issued weaker than expected guidance and then also looking over at northern trust so that's ticker symbol n TRS. It's down almost 7%, so that's its worst day since April 25th, but that did fall as much as 9.4% earlier in this session, so it came a little bit off of that, but it did warn that net interest income in, on that and really pressuring the shares there, but the stock is down pretty significantly still, close to 20% year-to-date. Yeah, let's take a quick look at the yield space. Most of, most of the activity, once again, was on the short end of the yield curve here with a bit of a sell-off there, a modest sell-off to be sure, but still pushing that two-year yield to a close above 5% here. That is the backdrop, of course, as we head into tomorrow, Scarlett, 8.30 a.m. Washington time. We're going to get the latest uh, consumer price index numbers here uh, for August. And at least from the headline number, the expectation is for reacceleration mm -hmm. uh, in uh, some of those numbers. I know the Fed, of course, likes to, to back out, you know, food and energy, all the things that, you know, regular spend people money care on. about. But nevertheless... I don't buy any food. I don't buy any energy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Of course not. None of that stuff matters to me. But, you know, this is a big issue here because we talk about this idea as to whether the fight had been won against inflation here. Yeah. And I think we get these little reminders, should the economists be proven right, uh, that we're still far from mission accomplished. I mean, as long as we're filling up our, our gas tanks or charging our cars using fossil fuels, I don't know if we can, you know, the fight can ever be won at this point because oil prices are out of the control uh, of the Federal Reserve. They are, and we saw that uptick. What is it now with a Brent crude firmly above 90, and I think WTI at one point today was uh, above 89. Yeah. So we talk about this idea of how that translates into what people are paying. And, and it's also the issue, too, guys, and we don't talk about this much. We, all, we talk so much about the idea of the prices going up, but we kind of forget that the prices that went up, mm -hmm. at least for a lot of items, haven't actually come down. I think that's a really important point. Um, sure, inflation is slowing. It's targeting 2%, but it's still an increasing, right? It's just a slowdown from what it had been, and people don't think that way. You think about how you want to go back to the way it was rather than, oh, it's rising less than anticipated. One thing that's worth noting here, um, I didn't realize this, but Walmart shares are at a record high, and uh, the CEO had made some comments today about how he's anticipating a pretty good holiday season. You talk about inflation, Walmart has done, you know, its, its reason of being is to keep prices low, keep prices uh, affordable for its consumer, it's seeing pretty good things ahead, uh, especially as it gets a handle on inflation. Barclays actually upgraded a number of retail stocks coming into August ahead of a lot of those retailers reporting earnings a couple weeks ago. So they're growing a bit more optimistic when you're looking at retailers, specifically in 2024, but then also that case of really not seeing the consumer when people keep talking about things breaking down. Clearly not there yet when you're looking at a lot of these data points. And we'll also get a number reading on retail sales later this week. You guys are setting me up perfectly to just tease our next guest. Mark Rosen is going to be joining us in just a few minutes. He's the CEO over at JCPenney, Romain. He's been there for a couple years at this of point. Of JCPenney? Of JCPenney, steering it out of bankruptcy. He's a, a veteran of Walmart. He's a veteran of Levi Strauss as well. The company recently announced a billion dollars in investments, not just in its stores, really? but in technology. Yeah. yeah That's so, so funny. I was having this conversation uh, with my family. We actually w had went to a mall over the weekend, and there was a defunct JCPenney. You could still see the sign, but the store was gone. And the big question was, does JCPenney still around? Well, and you I can tell them. You just answered the question. You can tell them yes. Okay. Where was this mall? Was it a local mall or were you guys like jet setting somewhere? <laughs> 
It was in New York State, Tim said. Okay. I never get the invitations jet to these. Set. <laughs> jet set. I was just jet, jet setting thing. to West Nyack, New York. <laughs> I like Nyack. Nyack's great. There, there are no. more former JCPenney stores than there are JCPenney department stores. It feels like when you travel around. Yeah I, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I think the last time I went to one of those stores was several years ago, and it was kind of a, a little bit of a mess. Yeah, I mean, also yeah. kind of just reminds me of Sears and the problems that, Sears, I mean, obviously very wow. different stories there, yeah. but when you think about some of those stories they, they like pretty that. pretty much ran that into the ground. Right, yeah. I mean, but all those legacy, I mean, you go back, I mean, to, I mean I'm older than most of you guys, but I mean, you go back to Sears and Montgomery Wards and mm -hmm. JCPenney and, and just how kind of those stores couldn't really survive, at least not in mass. And, and you sort of wonder what they did wrong then and whether you're going to see something play out similar uh, with the current crop of department stores that are out there. Yeah, the big question is, you know, before the pandemic, they were trying to turn these into spaces into experiences, right? What could they provide experiences. that couldn't be provided well, can online? can I just tell you something? I don't go to malls often, but one thing I was interested, uh, I, that struck out at me at this, at this particular mall I was at was it wasn't a lot of retail in there. It was, yeah. uh, you know, restaurants and comedy Lego clubs land. and well, arcades. Yeah. And basically, you know, it, you know, you really weren't there to buy any, to buy actual physical goods. It's kind of like yeah. what, you know, we used to do at malls when we were actually kids, right? Go out and hang out. Wander at the around. Malls. Yeah. Just um, get everything really? Have you guys been to the American Dream Mall? Yeah, I just went in down New Jersey. To the river have any of you been there? Skip Ross. No. I've been to Mall of America. <laughs> I went to the American Dream Mall. You can do indoor skiing. I did that a little bit. It's actually American really Dream Mall. That's right next to the metal. I did yeah. go there once. Go, go yeah, skiing. Be careful. You don't want you to go tear skiing. an Achilles or anything going down the street. 365 <laughs> Yeah, oh, okay, too soon. All right, too we're going to have to go. <laughs> yeah, too soon. <laughs> That's his cue. Do they still have to pay out the rest of his contract? I feel like, you know, three snaps, four snaps, oh, whatever man. it was. They should just be like, Maybe they Can we talk about... Is there an out clause there? Can, I, can we talk about the U.S. Open still? The U.S. Open? Yeah. Can we just talk about it's the like, Jets? All right, we can't I talk about the Jets. jets. I told me the last time they won anything. We got to go. I got to keep things. The 1920s or something? That is going to do it for Beyond the Dome. Anytime I could trash this afternoon. Thank you, Roman. Yeah, sure thing. This is our cross-platform coverage of the market close on Bloomberg TV. We also do a lot of sports, as you can tell. Oh, absolutely. We're on Bloomberg Originals and YouTube. Meantime, catch us same time, same um, place tomorrow. All right, stick with us. Uh, a lot more coverage coming up here on Bloomberg Television, a discussion about Apple's new iPhone that's been unveiled, and it's more expensive uh, for the top model. We're going to talk about what it could potentially mean here uh, for uh, the company and its earnings. I do just real quickly before we get to break here, just some breaking news crossing the wire right now. Uh, this on T-Mobile. We're learning now that T-Mobile U.S. is set to buy Spectrum from Comcast. Of course, Spectrum, of course, a big cable and internet provider here. We're learning that a uh, pretty wide range here of $1.2 to $3.3 billion. We're going to try to get you uh, some more details on it, but just crossing the wire right now, the T-Mobile apparently looking to buy Spectrum uh, from Comcast for anywhere from $1.2 to $3.3 billion. Don't go anywhere. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> Down day in U.S. equity markets. The discussion a little bit earlier on the program with Bob Dahl over at Crossmark talking about the correlations with Treasury yields. That's a big determinant of where stocks go next. The problem is no one seems to really know where Treasury yields go next. You take a look at what asset managers are betting on and you take a look at, well, what speculative hedge funds are betting on. And, well, they're going in opposite directions. And this is a big part of the reason why you've seen the markets overall, cross asset wise, still in a little bit of a holding pattern. No one really knows what's next. Maybe we get some clarity out of the Fed next week. Maybe we get some clarity tomorrow when we get the latest economic data. But for now, well, what we had yesterday, those big gains, six tenths of a percent on the S&P, one percent on the Nasdaq 100, pretty much a race here uh, on this Tuesday afternoon. The Bloomberg Dollar Spot Index really did nothing coming off what was one of its worst days yesterday in several weeks. And a big part of the reason was the Magnificent Seven, not so magnificent today. Apple down almost two percent. We're going to talk about what we learned out of the big iPhone event in just a second. But tomorrow morning, we are going to get that CPI report. And the big fear right now isn't so much about just what that reading is, but about the potential reacceleration in some of those headline numbers. The idea that whatever work the Fed has, ha has done over the last year and a half or so in raising rates and trying to get inflation under control, there are a lot of forces out there right now that might be, quite frankly, out of their control. Whether that actually leads to a reacceleration in some of the key inflation metrics, that's important for the markets, but so too is the Fed response and whether they have to uh, make, a, make a decision, a key decision here about whether there's more to do. Scarlett. 
All right, uh, Romain, we have some breaking news here, and it's a follow-on of what you were just telling us. T-Mobile is going to buy Spectrum from Comcast for anywhere from $1.2 to $3.3 billion. Uh, the closing of this deal is expected in the first half of 2028. Now, that's a huge wide range, right? The final price will be determined uh, based on the set of licenses that's subject to the agreement when uh, the two sides make a required transfer filings with the FCC. So, again, uh, T-Mobile is planning to buy Spectrum from Comcast for anywhere from $1.2 to $3.3 billion in cash, but this will be taking place over the next couple of years with a closing expected in the first half of 2028. Apple was one of the big movers of the day today, responsible for dragging the Nasdaq lower and also the S&P 500 uh, off as well. So let's take a look at what Apple has done today with its product launch. It was long anticipated. Our Bloomberg Technologies, Ed Ludlow, joins us now. Ed, I want to start with pricing for the newest devices, because for most yeah. of them, the price tag stays the same as last year. But it's a different story for the highest end iPhone. Yeah, that's definitely where the street's focused in the initial reaction. So the iPhone 15 Pro Max is going to cost $1,199. It's a 9% uh, price raise from the, the prior generation of Pro Max. And the thinking here is that there is an addressable market of consumers in key markets like the US and China that are driven by performance. Even if Apple can't drive unit volume growth, using that higher price point for consumers that are willing to pay for the latest technology can still help them grow the top line from a sort of dollar perspective. But again, the same logic applies to the Pro, not the Pro Max. The, the $999, you're getting a lot of technological updates for the same price point as the prior generation. One quick thing, Scarlett, on the 15 Pro Max, even though it is $100 more expensive than the prior generation high-end phone, it has double the memory, 256 uh, gigabytes of storage, which again, the street is saying that's pretty good value. Uh, give us a sense here on some of the other changes here. I mean, there was a lot of talk about the dynamic island, a lot of talk about the, the new USB uh, connector yeah. here. Uh, does that matter? Are these more incremental things? Is that really going to be a selling point for consumers, Ed? Look, we knew USB-C was coming. It wasn't of Apple's own volition. It was mandated by the European Union with a 2024 deadline. So it was bound to happen. Every analyst I've spoken to here, and there are hundreds here on site, says this is a good thing because it gives consumers some commonality between their devices. Um, I think there was a little bit of surprise on the, on the base models, iPhone 15 and 15 Plus. If you read Mark Gurman's reporting on the Top Live blog, he was basically 100% right in what he said he was coming. But there was some upside uh, surprise in terms of like how much development in the base models they've made on camera technology, processing some of the software changes as well. So it'll be interesting to see if those are substantive enough that the wider market for smartphones, which has been slowing down, can see a rebound for Apple in the rest of this year. A sell the news event, as is typically the case with these Apple iPhone events. The share is down 2% on the day. Chris, we'll have to wait a few weeks to see what some of the order and sales numbers look like for the new devices. Ed Ludlow out in Cupertino there. Meanwhile, back here in New York, the big focus right now is on what could be one of the biggest deals of the year, ARM's upcoming IPO. Investors are awaiting an opening price uh, tomorrow before the shares begin trading on Thursday. The order book we're learning closing a little bit earlier here on this day. Amy Orr joining us right now to talk a little bit more about what we learned. First, let's start off with the valuation. What did we learn? Well, right now it's still very hard to tell because they just closed the books at four. So the orders are still being counted and they want to actually figure out uh, the bankers, they want to figure out what are the long interests and also the, the hedge fund interests. And at the end of the day, they need to figure out like what their after, uh, the arms after performance is going to be. So they're trying to rejigger the book in a way that will satisfy everybody, but hopefully will bring a good outcome in the aftermarket. This is, uh, there's been a lot of speculation when we talk about sort of what SoftBank thought it could probably get, or at least based on our reporting. I think what was a 70 to 90, it was, it was some of the range. And now I think our reporting is it might come in somewhere in the 50 uh, billion dollar range here. Is that kind of setting us up for a crazy uh, opening uh, for this stock? Because this seems like one of those deals where the valuation is lower coming out the gate. But once this thing gets on the secondary market, it seems like everyone's going to try to grab it. Well, definitely there are certain kind of moving parts to yeah. it, right? Definitely they had a, a sharper and steeper discount to mm -hmm. the stock, which makes it more interesting. But also we have to understand that this stock in particular is it's slightly interesting. It's at an inflection point where it's, it's very, it has a very strong hold in smartphone, but right now they're trying to pivot into AI, which has a higher margin, which is where the, the market is going. Mm -hmm. So essentially they haven't actually really tapped it yet, but this is at the beginning of it. So if investors believe the growth story, 
then this is definitely worth it. Well, in terms of valuation, right now at the, the top end of the range is going to be 54 billion or so. So, um, but we have to look at the, the broader market and generally um, NVIDIA, like if anyone is trying to benchmark it against AI, yeah. NVIDIA has come down slightly around 7% or so uh, in the last few sessions. And then I think tech in general is softer. So essentially that sets um, the stage for the yeah. listing. What is the specific growth story beyond AI? What exactly is the company pitching? Because you look at the numbers for ARM, it's a mature, it's a slow growth company. It's profitable, of course, and it's got dominant market share, but it's slowing down. Yeah, they also want to actually say about the price um, kind of margin that they're going to get, especially when it comes to newer models and newer kind of AI technology, that they're going to have all the margins that they can actually command. And so it's not just a, a kind of grabbing the market share in AI, but also uh, a broader and a thicker kind of a, a margin. Yeah, arms exposure to China is also a risk, and it's something that people have pointed out because China, what, makes up to... A quarter, 25%. yeah, of its licensing and royalty revenues. Yeah, that's a concern. And it's really strange that during the investor luncheon um, um, earlier in the week that nobody actually asked about it. I don't know whether it was because people were thinking that it's a given or it's just that um, it's out there. It's really hard to say because it's probably geopolitical tension is something that they can't really control. All right, Amy, uh, great to talk to you, and I have a feeling we're going to talk a lot over the next couple of days as we wait for the pricing uh, of those uh, ARM uh, shares and, of course, uh, the actual listing itself, uh, which is scheduled to happen on Thursday. Meanwhile, right here on the close, we're focused right now on the Treasury market, and Treasuries yielding 5% are turning out to be a big hit with retail investors. We're going to talk about the shortest of the short end of the curve. That's coming up after the break. This is Bloomberg. Let's take a look at T-bill rates. They're above 5% and they're catching a lot of attention from retail investors. It seems that almost everyone from moms and pops to corporate treasurers piling in. Bloomberg's Alex Harris covers this uh, sector uh, like no other here. She joins us right now in the studio in New York. Uh, Alex, great to see you. You know, we only call you when we think things are about to go wrong. Um, <laughs> but let's, let's talk about this. I mean, because I, I remember we were taking a look at, you know, T-bill. So yeah. just take the six month and I know we're kind of at the highest levels we've been basically since the turn of the millennia, right? Back in 2000, 2001 yeah. here. Uh, but the buying that we're seeing in this space right now, it's less institutions and more just retail? It's actually, it's a lot of people in there. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, you have your retail investors who I think, you know, around the beginning of the year had said, wait a minute, it was like this light bulb went out and said, oh my gosh, I can get 5% on a treasury yield you know, spanning the curve, I don't need to be sitting in bank deposits. Mm -hmm. I, you know, and I think that's really what people paid attention. That's really right before the bank turmoil started, that people really started to reevaluate what am I doing with my money in a bank where I'm not earning anything because yeah. those banks don't want to pass on those rate hikes in the same way like a money fund will or what you could get earning, you know, just yield and, and putting that and buying a T-bill. Um, but you also have asset managers that either don't like equity, like where equities are valued, or uh -huh. don't like where credit is valued. They're saying, wait a minute, let me pull back my cash. Let me park it in T-bills. I can earn a little bit of yield while waiting for more attractive levels here. Um, you have asset managers that also got burned by being in the long end of the treasury curve yeah. going, wait a minute, I got burned on duration. Let me go back and let me regroup and put in a T-bill. So you have well, all these people sitting on cash and saying this is the best place right now. Well, yeah, and I mean, it's a compelling argument. I mean, a six-month yeah. T-bill, you're getting five and a half percent. And I mean, look, I mean, that's a pretty decent return in, in any year, even yeah. when you factor in inflation. But I am curious, and on the retail, just to go back on the retail yeah. side, uh, it seems like the narrative has changed a little bit. I could just tell you anecdotally, mm -hmm. uh, I have a savings account now now that uh, just a few months ago was paying me less than 1%. And as of today, it's paying me like, I think something like four and, and a third. So okay. you're starting to see banks finally kind of wake up and realize that if they want to keep people's deposits, they've got to do that. Is there more competition for people's money right now? Yeah, you know, and I think it really yeah. started with the money funds. And this is something that, you know, the strategists who cover the front end on, on the street were talking about is that as the Fed raises rates, mm. that eventually the banks were going to have to start keeping competing with money market funds to keep that cash. Because remember, money market funds have been able to pass on pretty much that and every yeah. every single rate hike the Fed has done, they have been able to pass it on because either 
you know, at one point, two point, close to 2.6 trillion was sitting at the Fed's reverse repo facility, mm -hmm. earning basically that interest rate. Yeah. So they've been able to pass it on quicker. And as people realize that, then the banks go, oh no, like we have to start competing to hold on to this cash. And, and that's really what we're seeing. You know, some people would tell you, I think the money funds would tell you, oh, this game is over. Like it's not even a contest at this point. They're yeah. sitting on close to 5.62 trillion of assets under management as an industry. Mm -hmm. um, I think they see we could hit six trillion by the end of the year. Um, you know, they think it's over. You know, other people say, nah, like the banks can still compete here, but I, I just don't see it if yeah. your options are now either just treasury bills and buying for yourself or even just a money market fund and someone manages it for you. So your story makes clear the level of demand out there from different parties, from different stakeholders for yeah. these treasury bills that yield 5%. What does the supply look like? You know, Treasury will tell you it looks good. I mean, they've issued over a billion dollars, or billion, a trillion dollars in, in Treasury bills since the debt ceiling was suspended in June, and the market has really responded to it. And, and so, you know, Treasury is comfortable where they're at. They're like, look at all this demand. Yeah. We could actually push our allocation a little bit higher. And, yeah. You know, they have a they have an ideal range and they're going to, I think, push a little bit higher here because they know there's still so much demand. I think the money funds would love to see these other investors, your asset managers, your corporate treasurers, yeah. put that cash to bed mm -hmm. so that they can in turn come in at higher yields and start buying more of the supply. Uh, um, so we'll see. Alex Harris, so look here at the short term uh, treasury market here. We do want to go quickly back to what's going on uh, in the public markets here. Birkenstock, an F1 filing here, a filing for that IPO, long expected, but a lot of people well, now, trying to get through the door here, they see a window of opportunity. Full coverage coming up after the break. This is Bloomberg. A rough day for tech stocks here on this Tuesday afternoon. The Nasdaq 100 down about a percent, giving back most of the gains that it had earned yesterday. Similar story for most of the other major indices as we await a big economic report. Coming up tomorrow, we do get that CPI report. And more importantly, really what people are really looking for is if we see that reacceleration in some of those inflation numbers here, that of course means that the Fed might have to do more. And then that means that the market will have to start to reevaluate exactly what it's willing to pay for some of these assets. You saw that play out in the Treasury market a little bit earlier today, a 10-year auction that delivered some of the highest yields that we've seen going back to 2007. Camped out right now just below 4.3, your two-year yield firmly above five here, a close at that level here. As we move deeper into the week and more importantly, deeper into the month where the catalysts are going to start to add up here, Scarlett, catalysts that could move this market higher or potentially lower depending on how things shake out. Yeah, all waiting for that CPI number at 8.30 a.m. tomorrow. Let's move on to something that I think had uh, a lot of New York football fans uh, shaking their head over, if even that. Jets quarterback Aaron Rodgers, right? He was a new arrival to the gangrene, uh, but a tough play against the Buffalo Bills injured the four-time MVP in his de debut game about three minutes into his taking the field, and he is now out for the rest of the season. The thing to remember here is Aaron Rodgers recently reworked his three-year $113 million contract with the Jets to include $75 million guaranteed for 2023 and 2024. So the question is whether or not such a risky and expensive move was worth it. Let's discuss this further with Steve Olenek. He is a member and chair of sports and entertainment at Mintz. Steve, you provide organizations and individuals in the sports industry with legal advice on strategic, transactional, and litigation issues. What are the Jets' options here with Aaron Rodgers out for the rest of the season? Two options. You heard it here first. Cooper Rush, he's available. You have Trey Lance as the third string quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys. He can be elevated to back up Dak Prescott. Get Cooper Rush with the Jets. The second one, I know people are going to want to hear this. Don't bring say back it. Tom Brady. Don't say it. Oh, I knew he was going Come there. on, guys. I knew he we was got to bring him there. back. Quick study, can pick up the offense. He's got unbelievable weapons. The Jets are all in. I think we have to do it. Okay. What, what is he, like 65? Hey, hey, <laughs> come on, come on. Not, not there yet. Well, financially, though, what, what kind of recourse do the Jets have? They spent a lot of money, a yeah, lot of goodwill sure. on Aaron Rodgers, and uh, some would say that they didn't do enough with their uh, defense as a result and left him out in the open. Well, they do have some cap space that's available. They do have about $10 million or so to play with. So they, that will allow them to at least seek some other people to bring them in. You've got Nick Foles available. You've got guys like Cam Newton that, 
that are still available. You could even get a guy like Carson Wentz. Yeah. So there are options in terms of the financial and the economics. Aaron did what was best for the team. And, and what you do is you go all in. The Jets went all in. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately with football, it is that contact sport where it could be over in a second. It is. I'm just hopeful that he comes back. It is, and but I mean, all the names you mentioned, most of those names are pretty high-priced names here. So we talk about a team that now, which went in all in financially on Aaron Rodgers, is going to maybe have to potentially go all in on whether it ends up being a Brady or Foles or somebody else. But those are uh, big price names, and I'm wondering, do the Jets need to do that? Do they just sort of take the L for the season and just try to regroup for next year? I don't think you can. Yeah. Because you have so much talent on that club. That defense is unbelievable. The offense is, has the ability yeah. to do something special. What, why? Can't, I mean, I don't want to get too deep into. I mean, it's in just sports on, on in of itself. But I mean, you've got what was it? They had the defensive player of the year last year, yeah. right? And the offensive player yeah. of the year, right? Yeah. So why isn't that not enough? I mean, I know the quarterback is kind of the linchpin, but why can't they do that with the backup? Well, I think it's one yeah. of those things where when you bring in someone yeah. such as a high-profile, a legend, someone that's a first-team, you know, Hall of Famer. Yeah. I mean, you're going all in, but you have a guy that's did, won previously. Did you buy tickets to this game, Scarlett? No, I because didn't. Because I think everybody, if, I feel like everyone I know went to this game <laughs> yesterday. People who don't even like the Jets, who even like football, were at this game. But, but they were all there for Aaron But that's the star power. You yeah. know this, right? Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. where people watch Michael Jordan, even if they didn't like basketball, because yeah. yeah. they wanted to see the it spectacle. It was a spectacle. And that was the benefit for the Jets. So what does this mean yeah. in terms of future players, future marquee players like an Aaron Rodgers negotiating contract? How how do teams respond to this possibility? Hmm. Clearly, it always existed, but this is a good reminder of just how much risk is tied up in that one person. Sure, and th that's the hard part, in especially NFL contracts, because it is all about that guaranteed money. Mm -hmm. So when you start looking at it just from the standpoint of a business decision, you obviously want to get as much money up front as possible, and which can be an assigning bonus. But then you can also backload it, where you can get that option bonus, where the player can pick that up as well. But you always do want to bring in the, the bring back up that bring truck right away right from the get-go once you put that John Hancock on that contract because it can be taken away right away and can the Jets claim any of this through insurance hmm. well the the ownership right but in terms of like the actual like in terms of the salary cap I mean yeah he's gonna be that's used up yeah and so this gets uh, to the issue, though, too, about kind of bringing these stars. I mean, I mean, let's just call them what they are, aging stars. Obviously, we know Aaron Rodgers was probably worth it, at least on paper, uh, to do what they do. And we've mentioned Tom Brady here. I, I joke about his age here. But we're kind of in an era, and you know this, where we are seeing at least certain position players being able to play much longer sure. than they would have done, I don't know, 20 years ago here. And, and I'm wondering, does that create more contract risk? Because let's face it, I mean, a 40-year-old is just going to, I mean, just by nature, is going to be a little bit more fragile than a 20 year old yeah the body breaks yeah. down but with the yeah. advent of all the technology mm. and what's there how guys are hiring nutritionists full-time yeah guys are taking care of their bodies so they're trying to really increase the lifespan of their career yeah. and if they are a marquee player and you have good name appeal there's always an opportunity Oh, what a disappointment, especially after hard knocks over the summer. Like, I mean, <laughs> there's just so many storylines that go along with this. Steve, thank you so much. Steve Olenek is member and chair of sports and entertainment over at Mintz. We're going to stick with football, but a different type of football player. Uh, he is making waves at his new South Florida mansion. We're talking about Lionel Messi, the soccer star, buying a waterfront mansion in Fort Lauderdale for almost $11 million. So joining us now for more on the cultural and economic significance of this move is Bloomberg's Jennifer Epstein and Miami Bureau Chief Felipe Marquez. Jennifer, I'm going to start with you because you cover real estate. Give us a just, you know, this is now real. We all have real estate envy, I think, on some level. Give us the details of what this property looks like. Yeah, so this is a eight bedroom uh, spread that's waterfront in Fort Lauderdale within about a 15 minute drive of the stadium uh, where Inter Miami plays. So he's going to have a short commute. Uh, a waterfront view while he's there, eight bedrooms for his kids, his family. Um, and he also already owns a couple of condos closer to Miami. So he'll have plenty of places to send his visiting family if he doesn't want them in that house. Um, but it all just kind of adds up to there being uh, plenty of room for him and his family to enjoy uh, life in South Florida. 
Okay, so life in South Florida. Felipe Marquez, you've been covering uh, the arrival of Lionel Messi and the, the lead up to it. Uh, how has Lionel Messi's arrival in South Florida changed the property uh, landscape, changed the economic landscape of Miami, which already was thriving because of the pandemic? I mean, I would say uh, with Messi, you're feeling effects in not only Miami, but you're also feeling effects in other cities in the U.S. I mean, when he played in New York, tickets sold out in minutes. When he played in Texas, tickets sold out in minutes. So he has, he commands a real following that's translating into economic consequences. I mean, look at Apple. Uh, there's some early signs that Apple subscription base for, for the MLS product that they have has picked up because of Messi. Mm -hmm. And obviously in South Florida, you have the more, like let's say, quaint effects, right? The, the amount of like Argentinian restaurants that have, that have Messi-themed decorations or that have, I don't know, Messi-themed event has gone up substantially over the past couple of weeks, especially because the team has done so well. Is there any sense here as to what the carry through is going to be from the impact? I mean, obviously, we know he's not going to play uh, forever, and certainly you can enjoy the time that he's there here. Uh, but what's next? What happens when uh, at some point he moves on? I think this is a very important question because we've seen before players like uh, David Beckham, like Pelé in the past, trying to make soccer in the U.S. a big sport or trying to elevate the profile of soccer. Messi has had a lot more impact than maybe some were expecting at the beginning, but the question is how prevalent is that going to be? I've interviewed a couple months ago the man who brought him to Miami, the billionaire behind his team, and he says a key part of this is going to be creating a culture of young talent and help like having Messi in the team, bringing you younger talent that will keep feeding the league, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah. it remains to be seen if that will actually happen, right? Yeah. Uh, and Jennifer, I am curious here just about the uh, the economic uh, sustainability of the purchase itself. I mean, I mean, we know he has the money. It doesn't really matter here. But I mean, when we have these types of mega mansions at these prices, do those things hold their value? Well, this one actually sold for about nine million dollars just a, a little over a year ago. So mm -hmm. um, the sellers, you know, made some money on it really quickly. Yeah. Um, I Did think, they actually fix anything up? Did they? Uh, I don't think that there was that much that was changed in that time. I okay. think that was May 2022. So okay. they did a quick flip. Uh, yeah. This was off market. Yeah. Um, so I watch good, a lot of HDTV and yeah. I see them do these these flips where they just put in you know, like new curtains. And, yeah. No, I don't. I don't. I think yeah. there's usually more done at this price tag or yeah. nothing at all because you yeah. know when when buyers come in at 10 million dollar price tag or higher they generally want to do things their way they don't they're going to rip out what's yeah. already in there anyway they're not going to want uh you know sometimes the penthouses that are go for you know 50 million 100 million dollars in new construction buildings in new york sometimes they're delivered as empty boxes so that because they the developers know that any kitchen they put in is just going to be ripped out again uh and that that is just sort of the way a lot of this works and so i wouldn't be surprised if you know maybe messi doesn't move into this place right away does some work to it uh to make it yeah. his and his wife's and family's taste and and then moves in all right the economic impact of Lionel messi certainly on the property market there and as uh, felipe was just talking about of course we know uh, just that, that big bump up that we saw in those mls descriptions are thanks to both of them here a focus on sports meanwhile we go back to the markets and well the deluge of new ipos coming all the talk about arm and instacart but what about birkenstock we're now learning that the birkenstock has submitted an f1 filing uh, planning for an ipo listing on the new york stock exchange bailey lipschultz joining us right now for more what do we know i i was trying to uh, just skim through the details of the of the filing and there weren't a whole lot yeah, not a lot of yeah. details, uh, as you mentioned, on the New York Stock Exchange. So another victory for U.S. listings, mm -hmm. again, German company, following uh, kind of in the footsteps of Arm, a U.K. chip designer. But looking at some of the some of the numbers that we're seeing here, uh, Bloomberg had reported it could be valued at $8 billion. Looking at some of the revenue number, they said uh, revenue rose 29% to roughly 1.2 billion euro last year, adjusted earnings of a about 394 million euros. So yeah. continuing that trend of growth, profitability, and you look at the valuation that this, this company- this is, this is like a storied brand name, right? I mean, this is like, it's coming to market with uh, decades of history. Everyone knows this, even if you don't wear a Birkenstock. And you know momentum from Barbie. Well, that's, 
and that's what I'm curious about. About I mean, you cover retail uh, traders a lot here. Do you think this is going to be big amongst that set? I think it will, and I think it'll yeah. be interesting to see if there's an allocation. We saw, or we're expecting to see SoFi allocate, getting an allocation of both ARM and Instacart for their retail traders. So mm. if this could be another deal that we'll be allocating to retail, you could see a bit of excitement, similar to what we saw with Kava. Do you own any Birkenstocks? I own so many Birkenstocks. Really? It's kind of embarrassing to say. Wow. Yeah. My sneakers, my sandals, I have boots. I didn't know this. Yeah. They sell boots? Yeah, they do. Are they open toe? No, but actually you probably could get them. Then there's ones with like fuzzy, um, you know, fuzzy fur inside of it and everything. Those are we could, we could take a tour through this later on. Okay. <laughs> but my question is, Bailey, I know you spend a lot of time on Reddit and looking through what a lot of these retail investors get excited about. Are retail investors talking about this? Not as much as maybe you would expect. There is a lot of excitement, though, about Instacart. Normally, what we see with the retail crowd is you get filings, you get news going out there, then they get more attracted mm. to it, not necessarily kind of skating to where it's going to be. They do typically follow, so it could be interesting to see with this filing, with these expectations, as uh, we get closer to seeing a pricing range, a potential valuation, if that will make Reddit boards or stock twits come alive. Stoke the fire slowly. Exactly. All right, Bailey Lipschultz, really appreciate your joining us. Bailey Lipschultz hopping on to give us the latest on this Here's upcoming Birkenstock Sorry. IPO. Yeah. Okay, you got Birkenstock, which mm -hmm. is going to be a public company. You got Deckers, which owns Uggs, which mm -hmm. is like the fur line boots. Yes. That's already public. Yes. And you got Crocs, which is doing surprisingly well for some reason here. Who you got? Which one do I like? Yes, Scarlet Foo. I like Birkenstock, I mentioned. I have Uggs, but you know, that's a, that's a winter staple if you're in the Northeast. <laughs> Bailey Lipschultz, do you have Uggs? I do not have Uggs. Oh, okay. I'm a California kid, I wear Vans mainly. But I mean, didn't, weren't Uggs big in California? Like all the surfers wear them. Really? Yeah. I honestly know nobody who surfs in them a lot. <laughs> Vans is also publicly owned, right? It's part of VF Corp. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yep. Along yeah. with Supreme, so a lot of kind of that West Coast loyalty. Yeah, there, there you, you go. go. Footwear, it's hot. Wh which of those three do you favor for me? I, I, I actually think Birkenstocks is going to do very well. Yeah. I, I just think the brand name is there, and it's having its moment, even before the Barbie movie. Remember, everybody was, what, the, the Bostons, everyone was clamoring for them. Yep, those, yep. Some, some I know, they were running out of them last year. Yeah, some idiot on Instagram posted them, so they feel like everyone <laughs> said, well, we got to have the same thing. All right, we're gonna we're gonna move from Birkenstocks. How is this gonna affect inflation, Scarlett? There we go. We're gonna preview what to expect from the U.S. inflation report tomorrow. Phoebe White, head of U.S. inflation strategy at J.P. Morgan Securities, will be joining us. This is Bloomberg. Investors, economists, and policymakers alike going to be closely watching tomorrow's U.S. inflation report, 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time, full coverage on Bloomberg surveillance. But right here on the close, let's get a preview with Phoebe White, executive director and head of U.S. inflation strategy at J.P. Morgan Securities. The main numbers that economists are basically saying that we're going to look at about 0.6 percent here on a month-to-month -month basis. That would be a re-acceleration in the headline inflation number. Yeah, definitely on the headline. Mm -hmm. I think focus will really be on the core figure there. We're looking for a two-tenths increase, so in line with consensus. Mm -hmm. um, but importantly, that would be the third in a string of softer core inflation numbers. Uh, and that could have some dovish implications in terms of expectations for the Fed here. Um, but you know, I think focus will really be not only on this print and what's happening at the Fed meeting next week, but yeah. where we go from here. Well, let's talk about where we go from here, because there's been a lot of discussion as to whether that dragon, this inflation dragon, had actually been slayed. I know everyone said it's way too early to talk about mission accomplished. But what if we do start to see a reacceleration in some of these key figures, at least the ones that the Fed cares about, what exactly is driving that? So I think the, the soft patch that we've gotten this summer in inflation, especially on the CPI side, has mm. been driven by things like declines in used car prices, airfares, big drops there, mm. um, some other sort of idiosyncratic components. Um, but you know, I think a lot of those declines are not going to continue as we go into the fall. Mm. Meanwhile, you know, the Fed is very focused on the super core measure, core yeah. inflation, excluding, excluding housing, core services. Um, and you know, within that, we're actually kind of getting a, a divergent message between the CPI measure and PCE. We've seen a much yeah. bigger drop on the super core measure in CPI, falling actually below 2% on a three-month annualized basis. Mm -hmm. The PCE measure is actually running closer to 4 What we think is the actual kind of trend in services inflation right now is probably sitting somewhere close to 3 And that's reflective of labor markets that are still pretty tight. Wage inflation is still pretty high. 
I know the Fed is looking at things with energy stripped out, with food prices stripped out, and of course increasingly with the rent stripped out as well. But we've seen this persistent rise in oil prices, whether it's WTI or Brent. And at some point that spills over into the, the core prices as well. When do we expect that to start showing up? That could, uh, the pass through could happen pretty quickly. If it does in our own models, we don't see a very strong pass through, if anything, more on the core good side, um, but potentially maybe, you know, close to a tenth or so um, on the core goods uh, inflation side. Um, on the, you know, energy price uh, side, I think um, we've probably seen most of the run up already. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're right, you know, oil prices could fall back towards the mid 80s as we move into the end of the year. Um, this is part of the reason why, you know, the Fed likes to strip out some of these more volatile yeah. measures and get a better sense for what the underlying trend is. With everyone so keyed into inflation numbers, uh, regardless of whether it's including energy and food or not, uh, there's been a lot of anticipation that the numbers later on uh, in this latter part of the year would be um, moving in the opposite direction because of difficult comps. What kind of, what do comps look like going forward past, you know, September, when we're looking at the end of the year, early next year? Right, so I think that was a big story as we kind of moved past kind of the spring into the summer that those, you know, uh, big jumps in, in prices last year were kind of falling out of the 12-month yeah. window. We're not getting that kind of tailwind anymore when we took a look at the 12-month run rates um, coming down. Um, so it really will depend on what happens sequentially here month to month. We like to look at the three-month annualized run rate. Um, yeah. And again, if we get two tenths on, on core, we could see that three-month annualized run rate falling below two. Um, but again, you know, we caution against reading too much into that. I, I am curious, though, just looking forward, because later this week we're also going to get uh, retail sales numbers, and yeah. we're expected to see some softness in there. And there seems to be, I think, a little bit of a disconnect between some of the official data that we're seeing and some of the more anecdotal data, if you will, for lack of a better phrase, about how consumers feel right now. This idea that they're already dealing with elevated prices that haven't come down. They may have stopped rising, but they haven't come down. Uh, there's a lot of concerns about credit card balances and other things here. How much support do you think we're going to get from the consumer heading into towards the end of the year and into next? Yeah, so I think consumer spending, consumption growth will be slowing as we move into the fourth quarter and mm -hmm. into 2024. And I think this is part of the reason why the Fed really wants to look at the totality of the data. It's mm -hmm. challenging to parse the inflation data and really get a true message. We want to also see what's happening on the labor market side. And there it's interesting, we have seen labor demand coming down even as mm. GDP growth has been very strong this quarter. Um, so we need to see again the totality of the data, signs that things are slowing not only on the inflation side, on the labor market side, growth overall continuing to cool. Um, and so we need to see things moving in the right direction and, and will the progress be enough for the Fed to feel comfortable staying on hold. We think for now it will be. Uh, mm -hmm. Our own call is that the Fed will be on hold through the middle of next year. Mm -hmm. um, but that's another reason why we're a little bit cautious here. I think if people are so optimistic that inflation is coming down quickly and mm -hmm. that the Fed could turn around and start easing early next year. We're a little bit cautious about that. Phoebe, it's always great to talk to you. Phoebe White there, she's head of U.S. inflation strategy over at J.P. Morgan. A nice preview of a big report tomorrow on U.S. CPI. Stick around. We're going to talk about some of the other big things that could move the market tomorrow. That's coming up after the break. This is Bloomberg. The big market catalyst for tomorrow it's going to be a big one, CPI here in the U.S. Yeah, and don't look at the core, uh, don't look at the headline number. You want to pay attention to core, which is showing deceleration. And over in the Europe, in, in Europe, we're actually going to get a state of the EU speech from Ursula von der Leyen. Yeah, lots of uh, focus on what they see going forward for the economy, for the region, particularly with Russia and Ukraine. And then back here in the U.S., uh, some big tech leaders are actually going to be meeting with uh, Congress people about AI. Yeah, Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg. You think they're going to say anything about a cage match? Oh, that is right. Yeah. They were supposed to have the cage mm. match. Wouldn't that be great if uh, Chuck <laughs> Schumer was actually uh, the referee of that? Oh and we're going to keep an eye on the ARM IPO. Thanks for watching us today. We'll be back tomorrow. This is Bloomberg.